Call to order the Committee of the Whole meeting for Tuesday, February 25th. Uh, first item on the agenda is roll call. Miller? Here. Rosado? Here. Beck? Here. Knott? Here. Chancet? Here. Barron? Here. Wolf? Here. O'Brien? Callahan? Here. Meitzler? Here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Here. Cerrone? Here. And McFadden? Okay. Uh, next is a reminder to please speak into the microphone for the BATV broadcast. Um, third up would be approve the minutes for February twenty or February fourth, twenty twenty. So, Moody, have any changes? Anything? Motion. Second. Motion by you or second by Sarone. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed. Motion carries. <coughs> okay. Next up would be items to be removed, added, or changed. Do we have anything tonight? Yeah. Okay, next up will be matters from the public for items not on the agenda. And I know we had somebody that wanted to come and speak, but they're not here yet, so we may jump back to this one if they show up. Okay, uh, next up will be opening a public hearing um, anytime after 7 for establishing a special service area 42 for the Nagel Industrial Park, PUD, Farmstead 3 development. Scott? Yes, we've been uh, continuing this, and uh, we're going to ask for one more continuance uh, to March 10th on this. Uh, we're still trying to uh, work some things out with the property owners, um, and we're hopeful that we can, but uh, we don't know that for sure, but we just need a little extra time to try and uh, talk things out and work things out with the property owners on this. So that would apply to the uh, item 8 also with the Ordinance 2004. Then that'll get moved to March 10th. Correct, yes. Okay. I have a motion to continue the public hearing. So moved. Second. A motion by Callahan, second by Meitzler. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And that'll also take uh, item eight off of the agenda tonight. Uh, next up would be the consent agenda. Your Honor, the uh, consent agenda reads as follows. Resolution 20-38-R, authorization to purchase two 2024 trucks from Bob Riding's Fleet Sales for $80,668, and Ordinance 20-20, -20, declaring certain property to be surplus and authorizing the sale thereof. I would move that we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. second. Motion by Chancet, second by Meitzler. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion okay. carries. Um, next up will be item number nine, uh, approval of a Class J theater liquor license application for Reddington's Remedies, doing business as the Bit Theater to be located at 161st Street, Batavia. Let me chance it. Uh, Your Honor, the uh, police department has conducted an uh, investigation and background check um, into the applicant uh, and found no reason not to issue the, uh, uh, the license. I'm not aware. Is the applicant here tonight? I believe, I believe he is. Excellent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Chief, is here if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, um, we'd love to hear from the applicant, too. Hi, I'm Michael Bratt from the Bit Theater. If you have any questions for me or about what we're going to be doing or what we intend to can, be doing. Can you tell us about the organization? What is you going to be doing? Sure. Yeah. So we're, um, we're it's a startup organization, although I do, I've run a theater. I owned a theater for a couple of years up in Wheaton. Um, been looking for my own space. Got the space at 160. Um, we're, our intention is to have shows eventually, I think, to start off with just Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We're never going to serve unless we're actually doing classes or performances at the time which probably none of that will start prior to about 6, six o'clock, I would think, on the weekdays. Um, eventually, we'd love to have shows running throughout the week, uh, different types of shows running throughout the week. Again, probably not starting, especially shows not starting before 7 or 8 o'clock. Um, and then um, doing classes and stuff concurrently. We would like to have like a youth program and be able to teach improv to youths. Obviously, we would not be serving, <laughs> serving alcohol at that time. Um, so we'll have locking cabinets and stuff for, for what we would be doing then. How is it different than what's already in the area? Uh, I don't think there's a whole lot in the area. So the, um, we're going to be doing, focusing on improv comedy. We're probably going to do stand-up and sketch comedy as well, but mostly focusing in long-form improv. Um, the only long form improv theater focused solely on long form improv out here is Westside Improv in Wheaton. 
Um, there's the, the Comedy Shrine in Aurora does short form improv, more like whose line is it anyway kind of stuff. Um, and LOL in Schaumburg also focuses more on short form. So I do think we're going to be, and we're going to actually teach um, of the big Second City IO, UCB is the only, um, is the kind of the school of, of teaching that we're going to follow a little bit more of their curriculum. They don't have anything even in the Chicago area. They're just in New York and LA. Questions? Sure. Basic. Can you explain the difference between short form and long form? Sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so short form is more, you know, with the show Whose Line I, Is yeah. It Anyway? Right. So that's that's a little bit more audience participatory where it's um, the game of the scene is already kind of defined for you. And you are going to have to pay me for this lesson in improv, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then long, so you get audience suggestions. You know, that's the kind of more the gimmicky improv. Long form, you usually get a suggestion at the beginning of the night. And then you do maybe a 20-minute set. It's more of an improvised play. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with TJ Jagodowski and Dave. Uh, his name fell out of my head. TJ and Dave, they're kind of the legends of, of Chicago long-form improv. Uh, Dave Jagodowski is on... Um, Dave Pasquazi, I'm sorry. TJ Jagodowski and Dave Pasquazi. He's on Veep. He's um, Julie Louis Dreyfus's ex-husband. That's, that's uh, Dave Pasquazi. TJ, you'd recognize him from the Sonic commercials. They just come and, and, and improvise for like an hour just, just by looking in each other's eyes. It's a little weird, but it's very weird. All improv is weird, just in case, if that's the answer to your question. But long form is more, it's a little bit more theatrical, a little less gamey. Gotcha. Thank you. Anyone else? Otherwise, I would move that we approve um, this Class J liquor license um, and send it to council. Second. Motion of the second. Any additional discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, approved. And let's talk about it. Yeah, Thank I'm you. I'm excited for it. I think it's going to yeah. be fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now I see that we have matters from the public that have shown up. Um, if you want to come up and, and address us now. Hi, I'm Juliana Cancella. I'm one of the owners of Bocaitos Cafe. I was asked to come, and we're not officially on the docket, but we just submitted our liquor license application. I just wanted to come and let you guys know about that. And um, we've already set up our meeting with the police department to start the fingerprinting and background check process. So I don't know if there are any specific questions that I need to answer. Then are you going to have seating inside? We do already have you seating. Okay. Oh, that's nice. I can tell who hasn't come to visit yeah, I me. <laughs> I haven't been there in a while. I've had my daughter pick it up yeah. on the way home from work. And, and I, I, you know I live there. in your ward. <laughs> uh -oh. Nick now owes for comedy and empanadas. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there with the city administrator and mayor, and my comment was, we, they need seating in here. So it's been a while, but yeah. they have been there. Juliana, you might want to um, talk about wh what kinds of liquor service that you're thinking yeah, of doing. So, yeah, packaged and um, beer and wine uh, by the glass. Argentinian wines, obviously. I don't know if that needs to be said. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to try. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else have any questions? I just want to say I think it's really great uh, – the business introducing Batavia not only to uh, the cuisine, but the culture. And I know so many mm -hmm. people have really enjoyed this addition to our downtown and provided variety and, and culture. And we really thank you. Thank you. And I would just say, I was just at a meeting with the boardwalk shops. Mm -hmm. and yes. Juliana was there and she's very involved in the Great. community yeah. and wanting to see other businesses succeed and Hopefully, likewise, with hers. Too. Absolutely. We can only be as successful as our neighbors. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll move right on into the boardwalk shop discussion. Alderman Ewer. Thank you. Um, so I guess the, originally I wanted to talk about the possibility of moving the shops to one Washington place if area if that was not going to go forward. Um, in the present moment, but I have talked to Main Street, and they're not interested. They're in moving. They want to stay in that location, so that's one thing we don't have to discuss. The other thing, and I, I, I'm frustrated with myself that I didn't pay attention to this when we first talked about this. 
um, this is a public project, and we're involving Main Street to help us out with part of it. But if Main Street didn't exist, and we wanted to do this on our own, we wouldn't be charging anybody for the electrical work and anything that we're doing in that area. So I'm trying to understand why we're charging anybody. It should just be this is a public project, and we absorb those costs with the money that we're going to use anyway, instead of passing money around from one pocket to the other and then eventually paying the electric utility. Um, I also see the prices are substantial to install that electric um, north of $10,000. Um, some of that is material, but then some of that is labor. If we're doing a project for ourselves and we're moving money around just because it's a labor cost, I just don't know why we're doing it. We can move money into the electric fund, but move it from the fund that we already have, that the money that we were going to use instead of charging Main Street. Because in essence, it just ends up being we're taxing ourselves, basically, and the, it's the citizens that are paying some of the taxes towards um, Main Street, the $40,000. So why are we charging anything at all? So I'd like to rewrite that agreement if possible. Can I comment? Yeah, sure. I think it's just a big misunderstanding because the um, all of what the project is, it's all being paid for out of the Economic Development Fund and whatever part of... Uh, so we are doing the lineman work, and there is the grant is for 110000 but it isn't that Main Street is paying the city to have that utility work done. We're just using, we're identifying that those are the resources that we're using to pay for that work, because the, the city is paying for the work. And because the work has to be done, so we've got labor costs and we have material costs. And instead of the electric utility, which should be treated as its own separate mm -hmm. corporation, if you will, its own fund, um, instead we're utilizing the economic development fund that was the leftover money from the state of Illinois in order to pay to have that work done. Now, that is, so the lineman's work is what gets done from, to bring the utility to the meter. It would be an electrician's work, and we do not have electricians um, employed by the city, so we would have to hire an outside contractor to do that work mm -hmm. to get the electric from the meter to each one of the individual shops. So it makes more sense for us to provide a grant to Main Street to perform that work because anything that the city does, we would have to pay a prevailing wage. And this way we're using less of that economic development fund in order to do the electrician's work on the project. And we can always, you know, the budget is, um, you know, the $10,000 for the electric work. We can figure out how to get that done for that $10,000 that was budgeted as part of the original um, grant agreements. And then the remainder of the grant is $100,000. And, and Bob had worked out, you know, the cost <coughs> estimates that um, the, the build out for each one of those was going to be about $7,000. I'm sure, you know, as time goes on, they, you come to find out that, you know, some things cost more and, and some things cost less. But as far as the first eight goes, there, the one hundred thousand dollars that has been allocated in the grant should be sufficient to get us to the eight structures that we want to build for this season, and then there still is a remainder in that economic development account. Even after you take out the hundred and fifty thousand dollars that um, City Council allocated toward the Gateway Improvement Project Grant uh, <laughs> Program that we have. And then also the $110,000 that has been allocated for this project, there's still about $30,000 in there. So if we get to that point where we're building um, the numbers 9 through 12 and we come up short, there still is some money that's available in that fund to cover those costs. Okay. So if they write a check for an electrician, we're paying them back? Uh, what's happening right now is... Um, Bob and or Sherry provide us with an itemized list of what their upcoming costs are. Mm -hmm. And then we have been cutting them a check for those upcoming expenses. Okay. I think Bob would like to <laughs> chime in on this one. Yeah, I might. Laura, you're absolutely right. A little bit of communication there in the beginning. 
Um, the understanding was the budget for the electric would be $10,000 for power to the buildings. That's how Laura and I yeah. understood it. So that's primary work and secondary work. Which secondary work is the electricians. So uh, Moose told us that he only does primary work. Mm -hmm. That number came in over $10,000. Apparently, we can get that down to ten, mm -hmm. But I'm still about $4,000 short on the secondary work. So if I can offer a suggestion. The uh, numbers from Moose came in at whatever, 6,000 labor, 6,000 parts. If we can pay for the parts, then I can absorb that extra $4,000 on the secondary side, the parts needed for there, because we're going to use volunteers to install most of it. We're going to have a qualified electrician on volunteer time doing it. So that would get us back to the $10,000 <coughs> for the electric cost and not mess up my budget too much. Are you asking for the parts to be paid for in a different way? No, we'll pay for the parts. Okay. Of that $10,000, okay. you absorb the labor costs, which were five, $6,000 in Moose's proposal. So we can't absorb the labor costs. Some, some, some fund has to pay the labor costs. That's what Mark And we're asking. saying so, yeah. not the electric utility. So we could pay it with general fund money. We could pay it with, um, with the economic grant funding. Is, but with somebody, I mean, it yeah. has to be paid for. We have to issue paychecks for those employees, and that's a real expense. Well, they still get paid even if they didn't do any work in a day, correct? So because the electric utility, it's, you need to identify, you know, I, I don't think that they're doing work for the electric utility. Um, Peggy, maybe you can chime in here on the way that the accounting has to be. Can the, can the electric utility donate mm -hmm. labor for this? They project. can absolutely donate the labor, but that would be whether or not the city council believes that's appropriate that all of the electric rate payers donate the labor for this project or if we use general fund money for the project. But the money should go back to the electric utility if you don't say that the electric utility should donate the money. And it would be through an internal transfer. We, wouldn't, <coughs> we don't write checks to ourselves. <laughs> I think the so, simplest way to do it would be to take the economic development yeah, yeah, right. just pay another you know, $6,000 dollars out of that yeah. and be done with it. We're all so that was, and, and that's the way I think that's what we all want to do. Yeah, we got to play. Yeah. That's all. And so I don't think any do, adjustment needs to be made at right. this time. We okay. can see when we get to wanting to build the 9 through 12, if additional funding is needed, yeah. we can add more from that economic well, development My budget's fund. based on 8. Not 12 end result. Right. So it's based on eight, and I'm $4,000 short in the budget right now with the electric cost being more. So, eight yeah, so, so my understanding. So you're saying on this. that eight cost $100,000. That's what I came in. Yeah. Yeah. We're starting off with eight. Okay. Never 12. <laughs> That's too much. Well, I think in the, in the agreement, the description of the project is to build eight to 12. Yes. Okay. Up to, up to 12 eventually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But then that was the what we, full grant fund. The secondary part of the Moose has designed it to where it's large enough to satisfy 12 units. So that's mm -hmm. in that $10,000, $13,000 mm -hmm. number. The extra four units is going to be minimal cost because your power lines are already there. Right. Your, 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 your main trunk lines are already done. Mm -hmm. Your pull boxes are already in. You're just wearing another 30 feet. Not I guess I wasn't talking cost. about the electric to the additional four. I was talking about the cost of building the uh, the buildings themselves. The project was described as eight. we're going to start with eight, but perhaps build up to 12 within the budget of $100,000. My understanding was we were going to start with eight, and that was going to cost $100,000 to build Correct. that. The electric was going to cost 10000 okay. more, and so we made it 110000 Correct. I think, you know, the, the, I, you, what you said, Peggy, makes total sense. Uh, the, having the rate payers uh, absorb that cost, we don't want to go that route. We've got this grant money that didn't come directly from the pockets of our taxpayers in this city. Let's use that. Let's $100,000 still goes so the budget uh, remains, which, you know, we are building them. You know, Bob and I have been putting <laughs> some sweat into it. Um, the high school has got progress. they got pretty much all the walls framed for, for two units. Um, and make adjustment to cover the cost of the electric. So the 
something because obviously the ten thousand isn't going to cost that whatever that amount is we can authorize that from the grant fund well i, I think then everybody needs to realize too is if we're at a hundred grand already for eight of them the city's probably not going to be able to participate in the other four no. because there won't be that money left in the grant right that's about money twelve thousand that five hundred per well, it won't be that much, remember, because the site yeah, will all yeah. be done, the electric will be practically done, mm -hmm. so the boardwalk will be done. All we're doing is building four sheds up. Mm -hmm. So the site work and the boardwalk are significant yes. costs. That's what a big you know, That is a lot of square right. footage of boardwalk. But what I'm saying is we're probably only going to have, what, 20, you think 24,000 left in there? Right. If we take another six out of it to pay for the electrical work. So that's all that, that would be available. Six, six grand per. Yeah. Which, you know, that's, you know, we've got, we're, the idea is we're starting with eight. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, that was my understanding that we were starting this project with. Yeah. Yeah, because I want to see this happen and I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I just don't want to be pulling more money out of Main Street's pocket to pay for the extra electric. If we have to go a little bit further on the money that we said <coughs> we were going to give, we should do that to get these eight done. Right. And, and this, my recommendation and this would be to do that at the end when additional money is needed for something yeah. rather than do it right now okay. so that we can... No, I, we, yeah, we got, we're not... You know, I don't think we need to make any like changes today. Option, right. Yeah. Yeah. When we get to that point, just come back mm -hmm. and we'll right. do a change order or hey, however we, we want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> we have the volunteers, more material donated. We <laughs> may not need it. Right. right. So we're working hard at that. Okay. okay. So, and I, also, I, I would like to say one more thing. You know, we are spending this grant money, but this is an investment. And I'm looking, yeah. to, I think yeah. we're going to see a return on our investment. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to shortchange this project to make sure, or I want to make sure it's as successful as possible. Yep. Yes. Right. And as we just came from the meeting with some ones that are wanting to be applicants there, and even business owners that are surrounding it, they're invested in this project right. too. Because if this succeeds, it helps their business entirely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was said, that was said a lot tonight. <laughs> yeah. And we fill storefronts. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Well. Then I think we'll wait till we get to that point, and then we'll like do whatever that. we have to do to make that change. Thank you. Okay. All right. The mayor's uh, not here yet. Next up would be the discussion on video gaming. I know the mayor wanted to be here for it, and he's not here yet. Would you be all right if we deferred that? To later. In the meeting. <laughs> later in the meeting. Yes. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I don't want the mayor yelling at me. <laughs> Uh, so we'll take eleven. We'll take we'll take eleven, and we'll move it down. Do you want to do it before or after the annual report? After the annual report. After, after those. We're not going to be treading water for very long with these items. So. Okay. Hey, Alan. Let's do that. Uh, and real quick, because the items that are coming up then, both video gaming and the liquor license thing, at Kevin's request or recommendation, that since the intention is there, even though I have not applied for a liquor license yet since the intention is there that I will eventually apply that I should refuse myself at this point moving forward. So that's why I will right. jump up and down a few times. <laughs> Sit back and watch the monitor. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for installing that. Okay. Um, then next up will be item 12, Ordinance 20-21, <coughs> revising Title 3, Chapter 3 of the Batavia Municipal Code, amending Section 331 on restrictions and uh, issuance renewal. <clears throat> so per the direction of the, of the committee, we asked uh, for revisions to the ordinance to uh, mirror the uh, Illinois Liquor Control Act, uh, which would allow for uh, public officials um, or city employees to have, um, uh, to be able to apply for uh, liquor licenses. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Nope, I've read through it a couple times. I think it does exactly what we wanted yeah. it to do. Haven't got all the language right. That's what he gets paid to do. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, then, if there is uh, are no other questions, I would uh, move that we uh, send Ordinance Twenty Twenty-One, Revising Title Three, Chapter Three of the Batavia Municipal Code, amending Section Three Three Eleven on restrictions and issuance and renewal to City Council. Second. Motion and a second. Any additional? Three dash one. Three dash three dash one. You said 3-3-11. Just like syllables. Okay. I'm just making sure. Thank you. Uh, any additional discussion? Um, in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
on Ice Habit. Um, talk about that? Or consent? Put that no, it can't. Consent. Or, or, she no. would have to... Yeah, that's right. Oh, it can't. We have to leave it on regular agenda. Ask a regular agenda. Thank you. The same with all of the uh, liquor license. Any liquor license has to go on the regular agenda. Okay, next up will be Ordinance 20-19, amending Title I, Chapter 11, Section 2 of the Batavia Municipal Code, Investment Policy for Public Funds. Hey, Alan. Alan. I'm going to step here real quick sure. to clarify. That is 3-3-11. The agenda is incorrect. Oh, it is 11. Okay. okay. The code is, uh, is correct. Thank you. Thank you. You knew that. <laughs> just kidding. You did good. I'm going to turn this over to Peggy. Okay. I have uh, the next two items on the agenda. One is an ordinance uh, removing the investment policy from our city code, and the next one is putting it in the form of adopting it by resolution. It just makes it easier and less costly when you have to amend the policy because anytime we amend the city code, we have to pay the codifier to uh, do that work for us. And uh, it just makes sense that it, as a policy, it's more of a working document than actual um, code. And so this ordinance just uh, strikes that from our code, and then the resolution that follows uh, adopts it, and it adds one section to the policy. The reason uh, we had to amend it is the um, state of Illinois passed a, a state statute or a public act um, that we needed to have a phrase in our policy that says we, uh, consider sustainable factors when investing our public funds. And so that statement has been added to the policy. There's been no other changes. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions regarding this? Um, I'll just say, I think, it's, I think it's great. I mean, I'm glad the state did it and that we will be following it. Like 10 years ago, I asked our financial advisor if we could only pick funds that were the socially responsible investment um, items, and he laughed a little bit at me, okay. and he is no longer my financial advisor. So, um, because we didn't, we you know, there were certain things that we didn't want to be promoting and investing in and wanted our money to be going towards things that we believed were the best for society. So this is, uh, this was exciting to come across. So. It really doesn't have as much of an impact on the city uh, pol uh, policy as it would for police and fire pension funds who do invest in, in uh, um, mutual, mutual funds and um, equities where we, we cannot as the city. So it, it doesn't have as much of an impact. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't apply to them, correct? I saw that in the memo. The police and pension for the fire. Business. Our policy does not apply to them. They have to adopt their own policy, and they will need to incorporate it into their policy, and that will be passed by their own boards. Okay. There's no other questions, then. I would move that we approve Ordinance 20 19, uh, amending Title I, Chapter 11, Section 2 of the Batavia Municipal Code, Investment Policy for Public Funds. Second. Motion and a second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, put that on consent. And then uh, moving on to resolution 20-37-R, that is the adoption of the investment policy for public funds. I would move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, consent as well, please. Thank you. The next up will be resolution 20-40-R, approving a contract with Standby Power System Consultants Incorporated to install inverters at Northeast, Southeast, Cherry Park, Main Sub, and McKee Street Substation for an amount uh, not to exceed $33,660, which includes a 10% contingency. Alderman Meissner? Couldn't have said it better myself. I'll <laughs> turn it over to Gary. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a budgeted expense for a project that's really being done to complete a project that was first started in 2019. Um, back then, we had done several, uh, several fiber improvements at our substations in support of our monitoring system, which is the acronym is SCADA. And um, those, that monitoring system is, is used to monitor the electric system as a whole. And 
So kind of going back all the way down now from the big monitoring system to the equipment that it runs on, now we're doing uh, the AC and DC circuits and the connections. Um, and they have a description in their scope of services that kind of describes how they're connecting the various circuits. And this will be the final piece to this, to this project, which is really kind of spanning over two years. Uh, so we are recommending um, contract in the amount of 33600 That does include a 10% contingency to Standby Power System Consultants Incorporated. Anyone have any questions? And we have all the equipment but one. We have all the equipment except main sub, and then, so we really have to buy one, 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 piece. one piece of equipment. The rest of it was all purchased under the prior authorization. And the primary purpose of this work is really the, to protect against the power surges for the equipment that's already installed, correct? Correct. Was there any, is that not part of our normal planning for installation? Um, I've probably said this to council before. Um, in the 12 years I've been doing this now, I still struggle with how electric does projects. Just the electric utility industry tends to do projects in pieces. Whereas, you know, I can't just build a road and only build the curbs and then right. come back two weeks later and then put the pavement. <laughs> I have to actually build it all at one time. But this is very common in how... The piecemeal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we're not putting this out to bid because the contractor is... This particular contractor is in our substations all the time. He's very familiar with what he needs to do um, and, and very familiar with our equipment. So that's why we... we there's Frankly, there's not... The flip side to that is, unlike my roadway example, where I can go out and get a dozen paving contractors tomorrow, you aren't going to get a dozen in the Chicagoland area um, substation contractors. They just don't exist, or you know, they basically were living in comment territory. So, a little more difficult to find people for the immunities. Any other questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, to approve a contract with Standby Power System Consultants Incorporated to install inverters at Northeast, Southeast, Cherry Park, Main Sub, and McKee Substation for an amount not to exceed $33,660, which includes a 10% contingency amount. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Consent? Sure. They can. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Okay, uh, next up will be current city liquor code and conflicts with emerging business ideas. <laughs> so this is another one that was uh, mayor's topic. Um, I can sort of, I know the gist of what he wanted to bring up. Um, more and more we are uh, being contacted about unique business ideas that p incorporate liquor into people's businesses and our current liquor code um, we are on letter k right now so um and even under each one of those subdivisions we see you know multiple different types of licenses um other local cities i think maybe you've seen aurora in the news they are attempting to do a consolidation and simplification of their liquor code so that um, new ideas have a category that they can more closely adapt to so that with each new business, it's not necessary for the city to change its code each time and then have that liquor license exist solely for the purpose of one business. So I think he was just bringing up the idea that uh, with your approval, we'd like to look at um, doing a overhaul of our liquor code in a similar fashion. So move. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just get the direction and when we... Uh, given, given those remarks, there are yes. certain types of business models he is adamantly opposed to. I'm curious how this overhaul will take into consideration a miscellaneous <laughs> category, but still be able to give us the authority to prevent some of these businesses that he absolutely does not want in town uh, to even try and apply. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's something that I think he would want to speak to, but yes. I definitely know that that is one of the issues with it, you know, is how, how you limit what you want to limit. 
He was most concerned about someone taking out, what, like, a space over by Walmart and putting in, like, a cooler and pretending to sell liquor just so they could have licenses for gambling. Mm-hmm. What is Aurora's uh, new code going to go to? I know they're streamlining it. Um, yes, yeah, so they, I think, based upon the articles that I've read, that there are only four categories of liquor license. Um, just to try to be very general about, is it packaged liquor that you're taking out, or is it a situation where it's being served on the premises, or is it for a, a singular type of one-time event? that is happening and another catch all category. And there are identified um, uses under each of those categories, um, but it's far more simple than what we're looking at today. Under the state liquor code, there are four, I believe, <coughs> um, retail sale licenses. There is a retail sale license, mm -hmm. which would cover the majority of our of our licenses mm -hmm. then there is a special use license which is for the liquor guy who wants to bring alcohol to an event and sell it then there's the special event license which is the nonprofit who wants to buy liquor and sell it at an event and then i think there's a caterer license mm -hmm. and those are the four state licenses so i'm assuming that aurora has whittled, has use yeah. those four categories. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. I think it's worth exploring to try to <coughs> simplify some of the, yeah. you know, we've added a lot of them, I think, since I've been here. I know that there's at least three or four that have been added. It's part of being business mm -hmm. friendly, right. too, to make the process less complicated. Yeah. Would um, the chief... Would you have any idea of what something could be simplified? I'll just talk loud. Uh, believe it or not, this current liquor code is a revised liquor code. We <laughs> didn't make an attempt to streamline mm -hmm. it. Uh, prior to this, really, our liquor code um, consisted of liquor licenses crafted for specific businesses, essentially. So over the course, I think it was five or six years ago, maybe yeah. we did that last revision. Since then, more and more business concepts have been uh, coming uh, before the city. So uh, I think it's time to look at it again. And I, I, I think Kevin is correct. And we can all sit together and figure out how to streamline this and maybe use the, the state liquor code uh, as the roadmap. Make things a lot simpler for us. Because oftentimes somebody comes with a business idea and they don't know where to go first. And somebody tells them that the police department handles liquor permitting, which we don't. We do the backgrounds. The liquor commissioner handles liquor, liquor permitting. Uh, but then they give us this idea that doesn't really fit into any of the constructs of our current liquor code. So if we had four more generalized classifications. It would give us more flexibility to uh, grant liquor licenses. Uh, you know, another way to control that would be, to, in, my, in my opinion, would be to cap the total number of liquor licenses we give uh, as the city. And then every time we would want to exceed that, it would have to be approved by the city council. Traditionally, the uh, local liquor codes is an exercise in control, controlling the types of businesses that uh, get liquor licenses. There are some communities <clears throat> that actually control the number of each type of license. So if somebody wanted a new you know, e-license, they'd have to come before the council so the council could approve one more e-license in order for that license to be issued. We don't do that in Batavia, but... You know, the liquor code has traditionally been an exercise in trying to, you know, control. And it seems like the, the, the trend maybe is going a little bit away, away from that hyper-local control to a little more flexibility, I guess. I guess I think we have at least two people that mm -hmm. yeah. work on that it and yeah. go forward and come back with an idea <coughs> for us of what our next step would be to revise that. Does that sound like what everybody is okay with? Yep. Okay. We have direction. Thank you. And now we will move to the annual report from the finance department. And right after that will be information systems. I think we're going to flip it. Okay.
But you didn't ask when we had item, uh, agenda <laughs> items to be changed. Peggy <laughs> won. <clears throat> Make me get the gavel. Up. Game. He saw how long we he just wanted to. Go, he just wanted to go oh home, God. and he told, he told you, you could, to open. He wouldn't show you how to use that unless you let him go first. Yeah, I saw. I saw how long it took to open on this computer. And I, so, anyways, good evening, everybody. Um, I uh, first uh, wanted to just give you an overview about some of the things that I'm going to, going to speak about, and. Uh, and then afterwards, um, uh, um, I'm open for any questions you have. Um, first thing we're gonna, I, I wanted to talk about was our technician, and we'll talk about infrastructure, uh, some of our software and applications. ViewWorks, of course, has been a big project that we're making a big, bigger push this year than we have in previous years now that we have an additional person on staff. Uh, we'll bring you up to date on GIS and then a couple of miscellaneous items. Um, our technician, Ed Larson, I think a few of you might have met Ed already. He, uh, he sits in what we used to call the soft room, which is now Ed's office and works out great for IT uh, meeting space. Um, but uh, he started the end of August. Um, he fits in really well. It comes with uh, eight to 10 years experience um, in McHenry and Carroll Stream. Um, uh, again, it, it's wonderful that he's got this experience. He comes in, just he hit the ground running. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have him. He's working on clearing back, a backlog of projects that we have. Uh, his primary focus right now is getting us updated from Windows 7 to Windows 10, and I'll, uh, you'll see some statistics on that later on in the presentation. Um, so infrastructure, uh, some of the accomplishments. Uh, last year we did purchase a storage system. Uh, we are now fully moved into that storage system. Uh, Todd Davis moved 50-plus servers over a long weekend without any downtime. I know there was a, a day or two while employees were actually working and he was moving servers. So uh, that worked out great. Um, we are, again, fully on that system. Um, project that I, um, uh, I came out with a little bit late in, in one of the uh, weekly updates was uh, cybersecurity preparedness. and. Um, it's something that we, as an IT team, spent um, multiple weeks working on. Um, it was something that uh, I think frightens a lot of us who understand what ransomware is, and it's something that we don't and, and hope not to get hit with in the future. <laughs> um, but we did create um, some scenarios that if we got hit, what would we need to recover, what um, uh, what items would we need? And we've taken those items, we've put them in the EOC. So we're hoping that we're better prepared in, in the in in the case that we we could get hit with with something uh, that devastating. Um, one area I know that, um, uh, and this actually came from Ed Larson. His previous community got hit with ransomware, and it came in from a personal email. Not the city email, but a personal email. Now, our city email goes through a lot of checks, a lot of um, uh, antivirus software. Um, but personal email, you, it, when you open up Google, it just comes in. You open it up. You, there's nothing that really prevents uh, something like that from spreading uh, some kind of malware or, or virus. Um, we've uh, tried to eliminate PC to PC communication, which is how uh, viruses spread or ransomware spreads. Um, we've uh, also tried to uh, uh, beef up our malicious site preparedness. So uh, when people are surfing, uh, we've added more things that they can't get to, uh, hoping that will protect us. Um, moving on, Windows 10 upgrades. Uh, so far, 
we've uh, we've had updated 53 or added 53 new machines, by replacing the old ones. He's updated 32 of our current machines that still have another year or two of life left in them. Uh, he's built 13 laptops, but we're waiting for another project to uh, come to fruition, which is VPN, before we start putting those out. So uh, we do have some VPN, but we're looking at more of a, a, a true VPN that connects directly to the network. Uh, there's 30 to, I'd say 30 to 40 um, uh, virtual computers. There's some computers and squad cars uh, uh, that we still have to update, and, and uh, that's going to be worked on as well. Uh, you, the bottom item on the list, those nice bright screens that we have. Uh, I know there was uh, an initial hiccup or two, Fathom. Uh, BATV and myself came together, uh, eventually resolved all those problems. I think it's been pretty um, uh, reliable since then. Um, I made some changes to the PA system. I heard tonight that it seemed to be doing better and there's not as much fading or, or, or issues with the, with the system going out. So that's good news. Um, we're getting ready to, these are upcoming projects, we're getting ready to order a new server for a records management system that we share amongst a couple other of our surrounding communities. Um, uh, Todd Davis worked with um, the City of Geneva and their records department to get a grant. So that server will be paid for through that grant. Um, we're looking at updating our copiers, which are somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, seven, eight, I think eight years old. Um, city phone system hasn't been touched in about six years, which is good. Um, it keeps humming along, uh, but it, some of the items are going end of life. We won't be able to support them in the future. Uh, we purchased some Wi-Fi access points, and we planned on upgrading and expanding that system in 2019. Um, that is on the agenda to get done this year. We haven't, haven't been able to get to that yet. Um, uh, I know Byron over at Wastewater was really looking forward to this, his solid brick building that they put up, Fortress over at Wastewater, <laughs> um, needs a few additional access points. Um, we've added a lot of additional video surveillance cameras, so we're, gonna, we're, we're about due to replace that server. That's coming up this year. Um, we have uh, some software and applications that we've worked on. Um, in the, the first column, we've, we've uh, worked with um, uh, B, BN Controls to get wastewater skate up this year. Um, Ed has worked to uh, improve our deployment of computers and applications using a product called PDQ. Um, it also updated our, our inventory program, uh, which of course allowed us to close out an old um, Windows server that was end of life, so we were able to retire that. Um, we are working, or Todd is working with finance on a program called, or a, a, a bill paying system called Paymentis, which will replace the current in-house system that we have. Uh, we hope to see that maybe by this summer. Um, or sooner. Um, we've made contact um, and reached out to the Davenport group who does our permitting software. We have a few items we want them to help us with. Uh, one of them is online permits. Um, that's um, a project that kind of got stuck in limbo between partially done and not done. Uh, so we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, get their help and push that over the finish line this year. Um, uh, in 2020, in the budget, we have an upgrade to our, uh, what used to be called HMIS, uh, our cemetery system. So that is going to move to the cloud. Uh, we're also looking at a, uh, a web portal for the information that's in there. So residents can look up and see um, um, who's in which spots and, and get some information and history on, on those folks. Um, uh, one item that we talked about at the last um, 
My last mid-year uh, presentation was an enhancement to the overnight parking system. Um, we're still looking at trying to get that done. It has not been done yet, and that status, the ability to put in multiple vehicles. Right now, uh, you can put in one vehicle, then you have to re-add the information um, that you've previously had. So we, we need a couple of days to work on that, and um, we should be able to knock that out soon. Um, part of the police um, server upgrade includes a new addition of the records management system. Uh, and one of the reasons we got the grant, I believe, and Dan can probably, or Chief can probably elaborate on that more, is to get to the National Incident-Based Reporting System, or NIBRS. And uh, I believe that has to be done by a certain time this year, so we're really pushing our vendor to get that accomplished. Um, ViewWorks kind of deserved its own couple of slides. Uh, I spend a lot of time on that myself. Uh, myself and, and Daniel over in the engineering department. Um, everybody's been over at Public Works, been very cooperative. We're, we're all trying to get there. It's a big project. Um, one item that I know we're, well, a couple items we're working on, electric valuation, uh, which is kind of at a standstill until we can get the GIS caught, caught up to the current um, uh, build that we have out in the field. Uh, we've had to go back and revise a number of things for the wastewater treatment plant. They have a bunch of new equipment we had to add with the new building. Uh, we're working with them and trying to get some of that scheduled. Um, we've taken PPS and created its own separate division and taken some of the um, items or activities that were in the street division and we've moved them to PPS. Uh, part of that is also building view works for buildings and grounds, and that's going to come, come up shortly. Uh, we're working with um, our arborist and getting some of the forestry updated. Um, uh, some things that we're looking at maybe um, a little later in the year is Julie integration. We think we can take the information that comes off of Julie, uh, drop it into ViewWorks and create work orders and then eventually get them into the field for people. Um, and then uh, something that's a current project that uh, we just started working on a few weeks back is the service request portal. So that will allow residents to enter um, service requests that will go back into ViewWorks, and now the people uh, who respond to these will have them already entered into ViewWorks, and now they can assign them to different people out at Public Works, then go look and decide what needs to get done and turn that into a work order. Um, some other programs uh, which I did bring up at the last presentation, uh, mobile view, which is an internal work order system. Um, I'm going to start pushing that out next week to um, our arborist, Jeremy Lake, and let him test it for a week or two, get some feedback, and then if everything works out well, we're going to start pushing that out to other employees. Uh, facility view, that's probably later in the year, and the difference is between that and mobile view is the facility view is are items that are not spatially located um, on a street or an address. It's something that's within a building. So um, buildings and grounds, uh, the water department, uh, wastewater, they have all this equipment inside their facility, but they don't have any way to track repairs on this equipment. So we're working on setting up these facilities. Later this year, we're, we're hoping we're going to be able to get uh, facility view out. Uh, field view, um, uh, that is something that should come out soon as well. That's an internal service request program. Uh, again, I, I think I mentioned this before, it's something that's just a snap and shoot, and now they have uh, an employee has something back at their desk which they can follow up on. And then the last item is for residential service requests. And um, uh, we're hoping to see that out sometime uh, between now and, let's say, the fall. Um, sooner is better, of course, um, but um, um, 
we're, we're going to have to look at that and see how it works and get that set up. Uh, Mike Kamen's been busy in GIS. Um, one of the big projects he's been working on is catching up our electric uh, system in ViewWorks. Uh, he's also been helping with the mobile side of things to get some of those mobile products up and running. Um, he has been, uh, um, we, we have been able to get uh, a product called Collector out for our utility meter people. So when they go out in the field, they can actually have a digital map with them. They used to carry stacks of map books, and we're trying to eliminate that. And also keep the current the information current so they have a current map and they don't have to look through three or four books to see, okay, what's, which one's up to date. Um, Mike, of course, does a lot of maintenance. He's been working on the census. Um, and then the last, last slide I have, um, you know, uh, bits and bytes, just some odds and ends that we work on. Um, security awareness training, we're going to start again in April. Uh, we try and do a, a campaign to um, uh, the entire city every three weeks, and that <coughs> fishing campaign sends out those cute, fake emails, and we see who bites on them. Uh, we did a W-2 fishing um, uh, probably about three, three or four weeks ago, and we had too many bites. So, we, uh, so I believe Laura sent something out to all the employees just to remind them to be safe. And then... Um, we're, we're, we've been talking about new employee orientation, uh, possibly on a monthly basis. And, and that's to get people signed up for our, what's called our SSRPM, which is a, an online password reset program. We get a lot of people coming in asking us to help them with their passwords. This allows them to reset it themselves. Uh, we want to get them started with security awareness. We want to talk about our systems, IT policies, and who do they contact for support. And then everybody will be connected. Um, so with that said, I um, hope I didn't put everyone to sleep. Is there any questions I can answer for anybody? Yes. Which alderman bit most on the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't want any public shaming. Well, since you all kind of vote on my position every year, I think I'll stay quiet on that. So. Yes. Um, I know I ask you a lot about the cybersecurity because obviously that is a big thing and a lot of cities have been bit by that. Yes. Um, with Microsoft, are we storing documents now at Microsoft through Office 365 or are we using those resources? Some people do. It's really up to the users. It's up to the, the employees. Um, I think for employees, um, and, and I'm sure um, I saw Wendy... Here, yeah, she's back there. Uh, for people who deal with HIPAA or with um, um, banking information, I believe they're storing that in house. Um, because even though we, we are on a, um, a government cloud, which means that that information does stay in the US, um, it's still out there in the cloud and it, and it, it, it can be um, vulnerable to attacks. So. But yeah, I, I, I don't believe I don't believe anybody storing anything confidential out there. Well, actually, it wasn't more about the confidential because, and I haven't looked at it myself. Um, the protections that Microsoft might provide there to prevent hundreds of files from being encrypted mm. through malware it may be something to look at. That it might they may actually prevent that from happening when they see that activity, rather than having to have software here and maintaining software here that's looking for that. So. I don't know if that's something they provide or not. I had thought about what would happen if, if we got attacked and would that venture out to the cloud? And uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how, how that would happen and if Microsoft would be able to stop some yeah, of that. It'd be interesting to look into because mm -hmm. that's all those companies have so much data out there that yeah, you would yeah. think that they would want to protect themselves from that as well. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't want to lose the people that have their information That's out right. there so they build up their security. It's their livelihood. Yeah. And they're always, you know, protected mm -hmm. and improving. Anybody else? Yeah. I think you had your hand up. Um, I'm just really, really excited about that at residential mm -hmm. service application. <laughs> Obviously, we've been building <laughs> that one for 
I don't even know how many years, but the foundation's been put in to finally come and see that to fruition. And yeah. that one, I when that gets rolled out, that's going to be game changer. I think residents will really, really love the the added service value on that yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It, it's really been helpful to have a, that additional person here because it allows us to expand our focus on other items rather than just infrastructure and keeping people up and running. That's, you know, having um, Ed Larson here has been a lifesaver for a lot of us. Yeah, it, that'll just have so many efficiencies gained by people reporting to us or trying to find the right person yes. who to report to. Right streamlining that and just making it click click mm -hmm. we're going to generate a lot of work that way <laughs> yeah we, we really want are trying to make a big push to get things out into the field for employees as well because mm -hmm. they're out there and they need to communicate back <coughs> um so uh, you know both the residents and the employees we we're trying to make a big push for yeah. so, just to as i'm hearing you talking about you know howard and, and um it's migrate 50 servers and updating 30 plus machines and and still yet many more in queue um and and just thinking about you know that all comes at a cost of your time and and the rest of the albeit small department um in that time are we are we still looking at any sort of cost savings by um sending some of this not only towards cloud storage um but with the virtual machines as you were talking about there you know as well i mean the, does that does that have any cost savings for us to recognize in terms of saving your time on maintenance of those machines and and how soon are we going to be able to get there yeah well you know i'm i'm smiling because this i bring up the subject with my staff every couple of years and um to date i, I you know we we look a lot at um virtualizing pcs and Cost-wise, there really isn't a big savings. In fact, there's none. I, I have not been able to find a savings um, between a virtual environment or what is it, VDI, and um, and our current mm -hmm. computers. Um, that said, there would definitely be some efficiencies with updating, um, but that um, has to balance out with okay, now we've got a bigger back-end infrastructure that we have to put in to be able to handle that and also uh, set up some replication because now all of our eggs are not in 150 plus baskets they're in maybe two so we lose one of those two there's a lot of people who may not be able to work but we constantly look at that and um I think um, it's something maybe we'll look at again in another year or so and see where it stands. Um, it's just difficult to, uh, initially, I mean, with, with just the two of us, when it was Todd and myself, it was really hard to, to push that kind of project. Um, having that other person, have, having Ed here, um, allows us to look at things a little more closely, a little more in depth. Um, I just don't know at this point if if that provides any cost savings, and I'm and I'm trying to weigh the efficiencies with the bigger back end and the and the. And to be clear, the time is is what I'm referring to with cost, not yes. not necessarily you know pure dollars on a line item budget. Oh, I so I agree. I, that, yeah, that's okay. where I mean with it. that's how I describe efficiencies. I mean, if we can. Um, um, update a computer and just say okay one day you're on this one tomorrow we're going to assign this one to you and it sits out on a storage area network somewhere somewhere in the in our cloud um yeah there's there's some efficiencies to that but again um it's going to take time to set up and maintain that back end as opposed to the the smaller computers that we have now sure. so it's something we always look at and um every time i bring it up a few people around here cringe and understood it but at the same on the same token though i mean knowing just how many systems are at play across mm -hmm. all the different servers yeah. um you know that you, you're dealing with quite a few software systems that most people don't ever have to even see that's true and one, one of the other factors which has um really affected the decision is that um, in a lot of larger corporations, you might have 
a couple hundred computers that are built the same way. Very few of our computers are built the same way. Um, so one of the um, uh, one of the thoughts is, is if we could find a piece of software that will allow us to layer things a little bit easier, that's helpful. Um, but building each computer, whether it sits on a physical machine or in our cloud, mm -hmm. you're still loading and pushing that software. Yep. So that's. You know, if we get, if we could take one computer and clone it fifteen or twenty times, just say okay, they're all set. That's efficient. We don't have that right now, okay. so we will we will continue to look at it. Anything Any else? Can I just make some short comments? Um, like to at the annual meetings take time to uh, recognize the departments for the contributions that they make to the organization and Howard and his crew support everyone in the organization in some way in the way that they do their jobs and they're extremely responsive for being such a small um, group of people to uh, provide the high level of support that they do on system security Howard and his team are, are ruthless on that. Um, when the W-2 phishing email went out, Howard at our staff meeting is like, I want to show you the list of how many people clicked on this. And it's unacceptable that 10, we had 10 people that clicked on it out of 200 and some users. And that's, Howard says, is unacceptable and I agree with him because you see what cities are facing when these incidents happen and um, it's costing them hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to recover the information that they lose and the disruption to their ability to provide service to their communities is completely put on hold and they have to figure out a new way to do things. One of the compliments that one of the uh, directors gave you uh, when he had to uh, re redo a, a training program, um, he said that what I saw was so good, I made my whole family sit down <laughs> and go through that training program about how these folks out there are using psychological warfare to trick you into clicking mm -hmm. something that will turn your world upside down. So and, and I thought that was high compliments to you. That, thank you. Thank you, know, thank you, you for the- protect us like that. So. Thank you for thank the kind you. words. Yeah. Um, if you're an employee here and you click on one of those fake fishes, you signed yourself up for another training yes. class. <laughs> so, yep. Um, Did you send out the Wells Fargo one this week? I don't know yet. So that takes three, sometimes three days to get around. Okay. So I, I don't know if I've seen that one yet. There's a lot of us who deleted. will send them back to Howard going, nice try, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, had, we had a few people who came back to me when the W-2 fish went out and said, you got to send out a notice. No, no, no. Just, just <laughs> let it be for now. I, I had to explain to them why we, we let it be. We wanted mm -hmm. to see who really would click on it. Mm -hmm. We did have some... Um, some phishing attempts, I think, that came uh, as disguised as a mayor, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. they wanted people to buy some cards, some gift cards yeah. for them. Yeah. And we, of course, with those kind of attacks, if, if they're truly attacks, we will send something out. I got my card for you afterwards. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't get Thanks, it. Howard. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Finance. Peggy? Yep. You can go ahead. Okay. We're going to do the video gaming one after this. Yeah. <laughs> so from for my report to you this evening, I did not really include any uh, departmental specific items. I concentrate generally on the overall financial performance of the city and um, 
budget to actual and receipts and revenues and things like that. But just to give you an idea of some of the things that we're working on, as Todd men or excuse me, as Howard mentioned, Todd is working with Paymentas, which is going to be our new uh, online bill display uh, provider, and they will also be uh, taking our online payments. So uh, Jen Fox and I have been working with Todd um, with Paymentas to get that going. It's a rather long and tedious process, um, but hopefully it will will happen. Uh, as part of it, we also have been working with our uh, bill, bill provider that does the printing and mailing of our bills and revamping our bill a little bit. Jen Fox uh, found that it needed some tweaking as far as where some things were on the page, so we thought this was a good time to do that. Mm -hmm. So we'll roll all of that out together, um, hopefully in the next few months here. And then some of the other projects that we've been working on is debt. We uh, refunded the fire station bonds last fall, and we have four um, active IEPA loans going on right now. Uh, we received drawdowns for the wastewater treatment plant in 2019, and also for Area 3 for the storm sewer separation. And then for uh, this year, we'll also have another loan uh, they have to do a separate loan um, each year and so for the next phase of area three we will uh, I'll be bringing to you another uh, loan documentation for that loan and also for the uh, water main and on uh, Prairie Street we'll have an IEPA loan for that as well and then possibly the water treatment plant might be another one that one is in process I haven't heard anything back on that have you Gary okay and so d debt has been active and uh, we were able to implement credit card acceptance for the police department Liz Perez worked with uh, them for parking tickets so that is uh, set up uh, for in person and online or um, over the phone payments. We don't have the online portion working yet, but hopefully uh, that will move forward as well. And so, this is, I, ha I have a lot of material and that's why I provided you with a printed copy, but I also um, posted it online under uh, financial reports to the city so that you can, you can reference back to that and to the, uh, other documents that I have linked here. So I, I won't spend very much time really on the numbers because I think it would take some time to actually go through and look, look through them. So total revenues for the city, um, we had originally budgeted 118 million and we amended the budget to 103 million and ended up with 99.1 million uh, with the majority of that, six, oops, 60% uh, coming from the utilities. Budget variances, there were a couple of big ones, and they were direct, directly related to um, grants. Uh, the Main Street was delayed. We had budgeted for it, and um, because of the delay, we came in under budget, uh, 3.9 million in grants. And the electric utility came in 1 million under budget for their revenues uh, due to the weather, um, and that can happen. Uh, we've seen it over the years go, go up and down depending on uh, the need. And then a 571000 in an IEPA loan that uh, we didn't receive the funds for. Uh, so then they were offset by other items that were over budget. And then total expenditures, uh, we had uh, $97.9 million in uh, spending. Uh, I don't like this mouse. <laughs> I keep touching it, sorry, and going backwards. Okay, so purchase power was uh, uh, the bulk there at 38 million, and then followed by wages of uh, nearly 18 million, and insurance taxes and pensions following with 12.7 uh, million. Um, we also had capital uh, expenditures of 11.5 million. We have a lot of projects going on, and we'll ha also have a lot of projects uh, continuing in 2020. 
So we had an original budget of 132 million, an amended budget of 122 million, and actual spending of 97 million. So we had uh, a we were under budget by 24.9 million, and I list out here the items where we came in under budget. Uh, capital delays of 16.9 million. Uh, the majority of that is Main Street, uh, including the sewer separation and the uh, water main. That's about $10 million. And then uh, the electric utility had about $6 million of uh, capital that was delayed related to the substations. And then a small amount was that some work here at City Hall that hasn't uh, gotten underway. Uh, then we had a variance for our purchase power costs of $3.4 million. NIMPA doesn't pass their budget officially until we have already passed ours. So we just have to use our best estimate of what we think that that's going to come in. And in addition, variances in the um, market power costs that we buy and sell each month will affect that cost. We have a 1.5 million balance in our economic development grant that we have with Suncast. Uh, this was supposed to, our 2019 was supposed to be the last year, um, but the projects that uh, apply for that grant um, did not get underway. So we're hoping that uh, that will be completed, and it should be completed in uh, 2020 with the start of the Main Street project. And then uh, we had an outstanding, an old outstanding insurance uh, claim that we were, uh, were working with, uh, trying to re receive a settlement, uh, come to a settlement on. And we actually had a, a very good uh, arrangement and ended up you know, being only 22% of the estimated bill. So that caused a $800,000 variance. And then we had budgeted uh, for full payments for the wastewater treatment plant, but that loan has not been closed out because the contract uh, is still not settled, but hopefully we're getting close to that and that uh, will be able to take place this year. And then just various repair and maintenance and professional contracts were uh, some of that and uh, wages and benefits, people leave, it takes time to replace those positions and uh, just delays in filling uh, the approved positions that were hired uh, caused a uh, $500,000 variance in wages and the associated benefits. So the general fund, the main uh, operating fund of the city, this is a chart that shows you the 2018 actual in gray, 2019 actual in orange, and the 2019 budget in blue, just so you can see the various categories there um, and how we compared to the budget and actual. The original budget was uh, 27.7 million for uh, revenues and actual receipts were 28 million. So we had a positive variance of 332,000. And then I just listed out, we came in under budget for our telecom utility, electric and water taxes, and the liquor tax, property and sales tax were just a little bit under, um, natural gas and waste transfer were over, and the, the, the really big one that was over was uh, the LGDF funds that includes income tax, use tax, and personal property replacement tax. That came in at 402000 over budget. We n never really know how much the state is going to give us or how much they're going to collect. So that's really kind of, that one does sometimes have larger variances. This one, we're pleasantly surprised. It's gone the other way just as well. But uh, this year, it was, it was good for our budget. And then uh, we had a variance of 150000 for um, video gaming came in a little bit higher than what we had budgeted because we were in our second year. And uh, interest was still quite a bit higher uh, than what we had planned. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to continue for, for this year, but we had a, a, a good year for our uh, interest revenue. And then I just have a note on here that these aren't the final numbers. As we go through the first few months of the year, we're doing several audit adjustments, accruals for um, receipts based on the method of accounting that we use. So these won't be the final numbers, um, but they shouldn't change significantly. 
Then general fund expenditures, I provided the same chart as for the revenues, just showing it by category and showing it 2018 to 2019 and then 2019 actual to budget. And then our expenditures, uh, amended budget and original budget are very similar, but as you'll see later on, there were several changes between line items within the budget. Um, each year I bring to you a list of budget transfers that are lateral. They have no impact on spending. It just goes from one line to the other. Um, and then also carry forwards from, uh, for projects that are not complete but were actually budgeted and um, actual resolutions. So we uh, will have that. Um, I've posted it on the website and it will be on the city council agenda for uh, March 2nd. So variances to the budget uh, ended up being just under $1 million. Uh, we had capital delays, the entrance signs and the columbarium were not completed. Uh, Tricom came in quite a bit under budget and our legal fees have uh, gone down. For forestry was not uh, where they had projected it would be and that was likely mainly with uh, separating out and having our own internal forestry department reduce those uh, costs. We did not ha do the river study that we had planned with the park district, and then some other professional services uh, account for that variance. And then repairs and maintenance in buildings and properties had 118,000 in um, supplies, utilities, fuel, uh, equipment, those things accounted for 140,000. And wages and benefits, again, are directly related to uh, people leaving and a gap in timing with replacing that person. And then we also had um, hirings for um, the IT department, and he was hired later in the year. And uh, also uh, three people hired for uh, the street department. We also had several people retire in electric and the police department. Uh, and then we're still trying to uh, fill some of those positions in the electric utility. So this is a chart just showing you uh, by department. So you could see um, what their budget was, what their spending was, and what their variance was. And then I just listed uh, the reasons on the side there for instance, um, information systems had a $92,000 uh, variance, and that was related to wages uh, because of the delay in hiring and the associated insurance with that, and then software support and repairs and maintenance. So you can go back and review this if you would like to see it in more detail. And then each year, we also provide you with comparative data with other communities. Uh, this chart gives you uh, population EAV budget revenues per capita revenue and expenditure and per capita fund balance and per capita debt. This information can be found on the state's website. Uh, the latest data that was available is 2018, so it's one year behind the 2019 year here that I'm reporting. Um, last year, our most uh, close comparison was Bloomingdale, and this year um, we are very closely aligned with Westmont, very similar in nearly all, all categories. I did put an asterisk um, by Lyle, Algonquin, and Bartlett. They do not have uh, their own fire department, which greatly impacts the uh, per capita expenditures uh, and, and sometimes the debt. So that, that does make a difference when you see a low number of, for instance, Bartlett at 550 per capita, but a population of 41,000. And I still thought that was a lot just for a fire department, so I went back and looked, and you'll always find that some cities have different ways of accounting for some things where they might directly report an expense in a different fund, in a capital fund, rather than having it come into the general fund and then be transferred out. So uh, some of those differences can also be related to accounting. And then I wanted to just talk a minute about the monthly report that we'll provide for you. Um, 
We report on all of our uh, financial activity for every fund. So governmental fund types are in the darker blue, and the pri proprietary fund types are uh, in the lighter blue, and there are business type activities. And I put the fund number on there because when you're reviewing the monthly report, it uh, goes by fund number. So I have a link here. Oh, it did work. OK, so each month this is posted uh, for you so that you can go through and review and get a snapshot of where we are. It's 172 pages, so I'm not going to go through it all tonight, but I, I just wanted to point out a couple things to you. So we provide some summary data in the beginning on revenues and expenditures of our major funds, which are the general fund and the utility funds. And then we give you some summary reports and uh, some charts on the composition of our investment portfolio. We give that to you each month. So in December, we had uh, 62 million in our portfolio. And this is how it was distributed. And then we also give you charts on uh, our various major revenues and comparison to prior years so you can see how we're doing. And then we provide the balance sheet. The balance sheet uh, tells you how much money we have in the bank and our cash investments. This is by fund. And then uh, it also tells you um, the accruals we have in place. Some of those accounts don't change uh, from month to month. Um, often, we only do some of the accruals at the end of the year. But um, it's hard to see here. but. There's um, all of the escrow accounts where we're holding funds for, say, the park district or school district. You can see how much money we're holding on hand for them because we collect the land cash fees and hold them here until they um, apply to community development with a project, and then we'll distribute the funds. And then we also have developer escrows and uh, DUI funds that have to be spent a certain way that are reported on the balance sheet. And then we have that for all funds. And then we go through and provide you with very detailed revenue and expense reports that are by fund. When we talk about, um, for instance, when we were talking about the pop-up shops and paying the electric utility, we'll move the funds from the general fund to the electric utility. Um, we do that um, every month. Um, we have metered accounts for everyone's utilities uh, for the city. So the treatment plant, the well houses, everything has a meter on it, and we get that data back. We generate an internal bill. We don't print it and mail it, but we have it uh, um, go through our accounting system so we can move the funds to the appropriate revenue accounts and move the cash associated with it. And then I just wanted to go over, and then the expense reports will show you by department. So you could go through and look at that, um, just like the summary I showed you on the PowerPoint um, with the variances. And we also have detailed investment reports that are at the end of this that uh, provide uh, you with information on the investments by fund so that you can see um, how the general fund's money is being invested, and uh, each and every fund that has cash will be on this report and tie out to the balance sheet. And then we provide you with um, one other report. This is the last report on here, and this is on our institution uh, compliance to make sure that we don't have too much money in any one institution if it uh, as a percentage that we're limited to in this little, it's hard to tell here, but this blue part um, tells you that um, Harris Bank had 10.7% of 40% allowed. So that just shows you that we are in compliance with all of our uh, 
investment policies for distribution of, of fun, funds. Some of them have 100% because there is no re, uh, limit on the requirement. For instance, um, the custody of all our uh, agency funds, uh, they're, they're all, they're, they're just holding the funds. It's not actually uh, something that requires collateralization. So let me see how I get back here to my PowerPoint. Sorry, I think I only have one more slide. Lost the mouse. Actually, this is gonna take me. Uh... Right back where I was. I'm sorry. I was there, but now I'm not. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you um, what the budget transfer list looked like. Try it one more time. It won't go past this slide because it has the link. There, you go. there we go. It works smoothly when I was at my desk. I don't know why it doesn't like it down here. <laughs> Probably some safeguards we have in place so people can put things in there and click around. Um, so, uh, oh, yeah, I see we saw it, but then it went away. There we go. So this report will be on the city council for your uh, approval of the different uh, changes that we've made to the budget for uh, 2019. Uh, there were some reductions. Uh, for both revenue and expenditure, no need to leave it on the final document that will be reported in our CAFR. Um, for one Washington place, we had it budgeted, it didn't happen, so we removed the revenue and expenditure. And the uh, IEPA loans uh, are just uh, budgeted for cash flow purposes in our budget, but actually, when we get the funds for the IPA loan, it goes on as a liability in our balance sheet and does not flow through the income statement. And then we had a division. Uh, Gary Holm came to you, um, I think, mid-year and talked to you about splitting up the street department and public properties. And so we um, needed to split those two budgets. And so there's a very long list. Normally, the list is not this long. It didn't, doesn't have any increases to the budget. Again, it's just moving from one department to another to separate those. And then we had a change in the accounting method for our sanitary sewer. Um, again, it didn't have any uh, impact on spending. And then we list out what we carried forward from 2018 to 19. Um, which increased the 2019 budget, and the 2019 to 20 then, which decreased the 2019 budget. And when these carry forwards are done, we always make sure that the project was budgeted, it's in there, and that they haven't spent the money on something else and that the money is available to carry forward. And then we just do a reconciliation of uh, what the original budget was and all of these changes and show how it ties out to our financial software. Um, we provide this to our auditors each year. And so that is what all I have for you this evening. If you have any uh, questions. A quick question, you mentioned the uh, utility billing at the beginning. Um, unless I'm totally not paying attention to my electric bill because I don't look at it that closely, I look at the number. Um, can we offer um, paperless billing? Yes, that will definitely be something. We, d we do offer it now, um, but because of the, the um, website for, that we have to view the bills isn't as responsive as we would like it to be. I don't, we don't have a good 
response for it. But hopefully once this gets underway, we will definitely be um, uh, doing some campaigns to encourage paperless billing because there is a cost uh, for us to send out those bills. And if they're just throwing them in the garbage, we would encourage everyone to uh, sign up for that because they'll be able to view their bills online and pay it right from that one website. Okay. Thank That's you. one of the things we're working on with um, our vendor right now uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that they'll be able to, how that will be communicated back to us, if it will be an automatic update to our software, hopefully, so that we won't have to do that manually on our end. Will there still be a charge for me for the utility bill? Um, yes, there will. And the reason that is, is because it can be very expensive to accept a credit card payment for uh, someone's uh, utility bill that, say, has a $20,000 electric bill in, in the industrial park. And uh, actually, I had talked to the city of Geneva because they were absorbing it. And there was a few that were paying very large bills that... Uh, they had to pay the fee on, and what that happen, what happens then when that uh, is absorbed, it means that all the other ratepayers have to pay for that. And um, we've just always felt that if someone wants to use their credit card, I know sometimes they have no other choice, but generally it's more of a convenience factor than a necessity. And if if it was a necessity, I you know I'm sure we could. Uh, work something out, but generally, probably not. <laughs> I know our utility billing is pretty tough about uh, collection, um, but we just didn't feel that it was appropriate. If somebody wants to earn points on their credit card by charging all of their bills, the other ratepayers shouldn't have to pay that cost. Okay. I just know that, um, especially with the younger generation, they're not getting checks, and they look for any ways to save money for processing their payments. Sure, so what they could do is uh, they could sign up for uh, direct debit, they could pay by e-check, um, very uh, low cost alternatives. Um, the direct debit is the easiest, it comes out on the due date, and uh, they don't have to do anything except mark it down, but who uses a check register anymore? I think a lot of people don't, so <laughs> the, the new website will be helpful in that regard. In the comparative uh, data on debt, is, is, uh, that includes a public utility? If, if you're thinking, it, does that include Prairie State? No. Prairie State's debt is not on our books at all. It's a contingent liability. Um, That's what I was getting at. Yeah. It's not debt. Okay. It, it is not. The debt is actually NIMPA's. It's NIMPA's debt. So. Don't ask me who Nimpa is, so. We just, um, it's just a promise. <laughs> He's sitting at the table over there in the blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's a contractual it's obligation. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it's, uh, the debt is reported on Nimpa's financial statements, and then we report the contingent liability in the notes to our financial statement. Anybody else? like to make a couple of comments. Peggy and I have had discussions about um, sources of revenue for which uh, people self-report to us. Uh, one of those is the liquor tax. And um, just to make sure that um, people are properly reporting, we'd like to implement a program of doing spot checking, spot auditing. Um, and But we want to make sure that we don't want to play gotcha or anything. So of course, we will be sending out to any of our um, liquor license establishes, establishments notice that we intend to do this in the future. So, you know, just so that everybody is making sure that they're giving us um, on a regular basis, their accurate records. Um, and the same thing for gas tax And the same as well. thing for gas tax. Except for gas. <laughs> um, but with regard to the finance department, um, the staffing level is, is something that I want to address in Peggy's department. Um, with regard to utility billing and the other employees in the department, um, everybody has a very specific roles that they fulfill and then Peggy does everything else 
Um, so her responsibilities while at the highest level of um, the finance department are also extremely broad. And there are probably things that she does that um, in other organizations, a budget analyst would have responsibilities for. So it's something, it's a position that has been considered in the past. I think it's something that would be adding value to the organization and being able to, you know, ad address issues that might even end up being a wash in terms of the salary that we're paying for that position. But I do know that um, it is de a definite need that is at this time unmet. And so um, while other positions have been funded, this is one that I think that um, come next budget cycle, we may really want to take a hard look at. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> I did do a little stomp my feet and cry when I heard that we were hiring the new officer. <laughs> and <laughs> And we did the splitting of the departments um, mm -hmm. because there is there is definitely a need for uh, some additional help in the finance department. Uh, our responsibilities have just grown and grown, but we still have the same staff level that I had uh, 18 years ago when I started. Yeah, truly. Where are you on the software? Are we still on? Have, on the budget have, software? Do you have software they can, they can still make your life easier? Uh, no. Um, we uh, did carry over the funds that uh, Howard had budgeted for um, software for the budget, but the one program that we looked at was very costly, and it, it just didn't seem that it was worth the expense. Um, I think overall, what was it? I think half a million dollars, and it just... What we have is working, and it, it's not the worst in the world. Actually, I hear more complaints from other departments because they only use it once a year kind of thing, kind of how I complain about llama. Speaking in general terms, as long as the applicant wasn't interested in horses, I would support any anybody to join you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, off that subject, going back to the audit, mm -hmm. um, uh, Alcohol and, and gas, I support it. Mm -hmm. um, is that that should be normal, right? I mean, are other municipalities doing that on a regular basis? Yes uh, and no. No, I'm not no, sure no. Um, who who all um, actually goes out and does a, a field audit. Uh, we do have it in our ordinance that. Um, they are supposed to uh, keep records of everything and provide copies of their state return uh, to support what they've provided to us if, re if requested by us. So what we're suggesting is that we would probably request some of those on a random basis. You know, we don't have that many of either one, so it would maybe only be one or two. Yeah, I think that's good to be able to check just to make sure yeah. that being done correctly. Mm -hmm. else? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks. All the de boring departments got done tonight, so <laughs> hopefully it'll be something more exciting next. <laughs> okay. So for our direction earlier, we will go jump back to item number 11 uh, for a discussion on video gaming. Mark, okay. You want to start? Um, I've made no secret about, I'll just call it my disdain for the video gaming, um, and had some email exchanges with uh, Kevin. Kevin will probably be able to explain some of this stuff a little bit better, but it, what I read through his emails is some of the stuff that actually frightens me even more is that the way we have conditional use is probably not the best way to try and manage um, gaming license, because the condition is more about, hey, is it the right place for it? Rather than, I do not want any more gaming in Batavia. Um, it's a little, it, exactly like the, uh, the tattoo, um, the piercings and everything. It fall, follows the same lines. So I do not want more in Batavia. And I see the safest way towards that is just saying, remove it from ordinance and grandfather anybody that's still in it um, is the way the safest way 
because I think anything, even if you put a limit and you say, okay, well, we're going to cap it at this, you're going to have somebody say, well, that's not fair. Um, if a new restaurant opens up and they want to have a gaming license, they're going to say every other um, restaurant in the downtown mixed use area has a gaming license. Why can't I? I think that that sets us up for a lawsuit at some point. And the only way to prevent that would be to say we just prohibit it. So that's my piece. So I'll just kind of lay it out there for any other discussion on it um, and any other comments anybody else has. I guess I don't feel like, one, that we have a problem, and I don't believe that moving forward that we're going to have a problem. We have pretty adamantly talked about what we will or will not allow within the um, constraints we have now and the ordinance we have. And, you know, what do we have, five licenses? Eight. Eight total. Anyone with a, with a D1 or D2 liquor license can get it. Mm -hmm. It's conditional use, but there's... It, every restaurant, basically, that has a liquor license... You name every restaurant in town that has a liquor license. They can all have gaming machines, and you you can't just say, eh, yeah, I don't want um, <coughs> TGI Fridays to have it. Not that I think TGI Fridays is going to do it. I don't want Swordfish to have it. You can't just, we can't just say that. You can't just say, I don't want it there. It doesn't fit there, because the conditional use is just about the fact that they meet that condition of having that license. So it could get completely out of hand. and. We know of some that are ready to do it. And, and I obviously, I know the mayor doesn't want the um, little pop-up shops. And I think that's pretty easy based on the liquor license they would get. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think if you count the number of restaurants in Batavia, it could easily get out of hand. There's something like 30, 35 restaurants in Batavia that sell liquor. Right? Right. right. So we could have... What is that? That's 150 machines. So I think it could get out of hand. I guess that's up to the business owners. <laughs> it's and up if to they us. Well, it's also up to their patrons. And if the patrons don't want to go into one that has it, they won't go in it. And then the business will close or they won't have gaming machines. I think it's pretty much self-limiting the way it is. We have had um, one restaurant who um, had them and then ended up having them taken out because um, they just didn't have very many patrons for the machines as they expected. Um, also, the I think we've had it in place for a year and a half or two years mm -hmm. now, and we only have um, one restaurant that I would characterize as less than more restaurant than bar. So we don't really have an avalanche of applications for these. We do have two restaurants who have applications pending right now, though. So I would add that. Yeah, I would churn in with the thought that, you know, I kind of share Alderman Err's concerns. Uh, on the other side of the coin, if you look at the investment that's been made in downtown Batavia, and in our business community in the last couple of years, I don't know the exact number, and I'm kind of pulling this one out, but I would tell you we've had an excess of over $3 million invested in new businesses coming into town. And most of that is restaurants. And I will tell you right now, we got one of them sitting out in the audience, but we have probably maybe three or four more restaurants that are on the doorstep here right now wanting to come into Davia. And every conversation I've had or Scott has had or whomever with you know, this comes up, you know, what's the condition? Can we do this? We think this will be one of the sweeteners of our, of our situation. Um, River, Riverside over here, Pizza, they came in and bought their license three months early before they ever opened because we had this time constraint on it. You had to have a liquor license for a year before you could apply for the license for the gaming machine. And so they wanted to get a jump on it. So now they're on the doorstep saying, well, we got our jump and we're here and we want our license. So... Every one of these, I feel good about from the perspective that the council's got to vote on that we're going to give them to you. I mean, that, that they're just not walking in and waltzing out. What I found very problematic 
I, last Friday, we had a meeting of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus general membership down at the uh, downtown Chicago. And uh, we had about 90 mayors there. And this was a very active conversation about video poker, or video, or not video poker, and the, and the machines, and liquor, and how the whole thing is coming together. And one of the things that came out was is that uh, there's going to be a new business as soon as some law gets passed in Springfield that's going to expand the video poker machine, and that's going to be for the marijuana industry. We're going to have smoke shops where they bring in the video poker machines, and then you go in there, and instead of buying a beer, you, you try different types of marijuana and kind of smoke the place up where you go in and inhale the fumes or whatever you're doing, something like this. And several of the mayors said, well, it's going to fill a bunch of the vacant stores I got in my downtown that don't have any activity, so I guess I'm going to go along with it if it gets approved. <coughs> I mean, I would really be very concerned if we turned several of Wilson Street or Batavia Avenue into two or three smoke shops and have them out there. And we'd probably have to jump on it like we did with the massage business and go in and do some raids and everything else. Unfortunately, because of the competent police department we have in this town, we got rid of the massage parlors in about five minutes time one morning when we did a sting on them all and they all failed this sting and that was goodbye to that. So I've kind of, you know, I'm kind of preaching here to the choir, but I'm, I'm harking about some of the stuff I've seen and some of the shenanigans that have been pulled and this whole thing about cannabis now making smoke shops is very threatening to me as far as what that could present as an image of downtown Batavia. And one thing I will tell you is I think those that we have out in here, and I'm not necessarily a fan, but I guess I, you have to kind of go along with what you see. These stores come in, and they do a pretty good job of kind of keeping control over the video poker machines. I, don't, I haven't had a lot of people complain to me. I've got three places that are existing business right now that have asked about wanting to come in. And talking to some of my friends who are mayors in uh, western Cook County, Everybody tells me the trend in their towns, and a couple of them have this, and a couple of them have re rejected it, is they want to get these smoke shops and these uh, video cafes or whatever you want to call it near senior living communities. So if you've got like a River Rain or a Heritage Woods or Homestead or any of these places, they try to get these babies in close proximity to that because <coughs> one of the great, apparently one of the big trading partnerships in this is the senior citizens come over and sit in the in the place for a couple hours and play the machines so they want to get this real so i had a guy show up on the doorstep here about two or three months ago and he was really excited about trying to rent one of the storefronts out at randall and fabian right there across the street from Smashburger, because he wanted to get in there because he figured out that with Windmill Manor and Homestead down the street and the other new one under construction out there, this was going to be a real sweet spot to have a video poker machine storefront. Fortunately, he found out that our ordinance really made it very difficult for him to even think about doing that because he didn't really care about the liquor part of it. He just wanted to have the machines. And he said, well, you can go, and he told me this, so I went over and looked at it. He says, I, you can go over to Countryside. Now, Countryside is a little town that's just south of LaGrange on, on LaGrange Road. He says, we got a shop over there, and you go in there, and we just got a cooler in the corner. So, so we buy a liquor license for it, but we don't really care if we sell any liquor. We just want to, want to run the machines. So I went in there, and they had coffee. So I bought myself a cup of coffee and just sat there and watched it for a while. And all they were doing was playing the machines and a couple of them drinking coffee. And so the guy, I said to the guy that was there, what, he says, oh, I got the beer over here in the cooler if you want one. He says, I haven't sold one in two days. So, I mean, these things take on a life of their own, and every area apparently is a little bit different for them. But I think Alderman Ur raises an interesting point that we got to be watch these very carefully as to what we're doing here with them. My two cents. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in? I guess I'm of the opinion we kind of got control of it right now. And that's, I guess, my overreaching feel on this is that we have the control we have in front of us. If we get to the point where there are applications in front of us for the situation that you're talking about, what I'll call just the cafe side of it, mm -hmm. 
Um, I think we have to figure out, can we classify that? And that may be a question that Kevin could answer for us. If we craft an ordinance that prohibits those or change to our ordinance that would prohibit something like that, because I think that's the one that, you know, I, I don't think you can prohibit it. It's a legal business. I think the, the way to address it, probably the easiest way to address it is through the liquor code and um, limit liquor licenses to uh, restaurants with a minimum number of tables type of thing. Yeah. And, and uh, that's probably the easiest way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Elliot? Yeah, I, get, I, I guess I would, I mean, it's no secret where I stand on this one. Um, I certainly don't want to see it expand. I, I certainly don't want to see standalones, um, you know, with nothing but machines. Um, to, to my mind, why don't we just entertain a full-out casino then? Um, you know, but it, I also struggle with how do we peel this back? Um, you know, it, it, we already have, like like was said, eight places that, that now have these licenses. Um, to their credit, yes, they are operating, you know, in, in good form and, and you know, I'm not hearing people complain about them, so maybe it is just my mental block. Um, you know, but but knowing that there's some 30 plus places that could qualify, could come in here, and <coughs> certainly as they, you know, start to hear that, you know, this could be an extra, even 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand a year into their pockets, they're possibly going to come do that, and I just don't think that's what we want to see across Batavia. Um, so I, 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 I'm not sure if a ceiling. Uh, the number of uh, permits is the right answer because then I think you're handicapping some businesses. Um, I'm not sure if if just yanking it out right is is the right answer because as much as I want to see it go, um, you now have some businesses that are are relying on that income as well. Um, but I, I would certainly not support anything of a standalone shop. That's for certain. Mm -hmm. And and anything we could do to tighten up as well the notion that um, it's supplemental. It's not the primary. I, I think would be good uh, for us to take it under advisement. I would totally support you in that. I mean, I I heard the warning shot last Sunday, last Friday in Chicago <coughs> from some of the cities who are already starting to deal with this conversation. And I think that you know we should maybe do some tweaking on the ordinance. And certainly, Kevin and his staff are excellent at doing this of trying to you know put something in writing and out there so that the rest of the world walks in and reads it and says, well, this town doesn't want us. We'll go bye-bye and go down down the road someplace. That's fine. But I, I think that's a message I would like to see us send. <coughs> but in the same token, I don't want to penalize these guys who have come in here and put their hard-earned money on the table and put some significant business into Batavia that I'm pleased that we have. Mike? On our liquor code, aren't we checking those businesses that have had a liquor license for a year and want to uh, apply for a gambling license? Aren't we checking those places out to make sure they have a full functioning operating bar? Yes. Yes. Or, or restaurant? Okay. Uh, currently, uh, currently, I believe we have we have six video gambling licenses. Uh, we're getting ready to have a seventh, and I think there are several more applications in the pipeline that are re uh, right now. In community development, uh, if they finish there, they'll come to us for the background investigation. But uh, in addition to the restaurants, I believe in accordance with the current ordinance, taverns are allowed to have video gambling. Right. Uh, truck truck stops. We we currently have one that's licensed for video gambling and uh, fraternal organizations mm -hmm. as well, which we do have one of those in town. So it's not just Class D licenses; it's A, D, and the other the other ones I've already indicated. But yes, we we are aware of the businesses. They're all. Like I said, there's only six, so it's not too hard to keep track of. Right. But they're all, you know, established restaurants or taverns uh, at this point. And uh, because of the prohibition or the requirement to have a liquor license for at least 12 months prior to applying for video gambling licenses, um, none of these dotties or um, these standalone places are able to get into town. And so if we do revise the liquor code, I, I would uh, recommend highly that we keep that in, mm -hmm. in the, in the right. code. And, and that's one of the things that I was at peace with when we passed this to begin with, when we okayed that. That was something we talked about all along, is that we didn't want those to show up mm -hmm. and have just, you know, the random cafe that fills the space in a strip mall. Um, so, you know, I feel like we have that. If there's another layer that we need to add to it to restrict those more, <laughs> prohibit in a way 
prohibit those, then that's fine with me. I don't know that we need to set a ceiling and, and limit the ability of, you know, businesses that want that as part of their business. You know, any more than we're going to limit liquor licenses if somebody wants to open another restaurant and have another liquor license. Marty? Yeah, so I was a no originally for the, the exact same kind of rationale. And at that time, we did not know what we were getting into. It was, how many votes did we have on that? Four or five before the ban actually was lifted. When was the ban lifted? What year was that? Was that 16 or 17? I think it was 17. Okay. Because I feel like I was here for was, about a year. It was 2016. It was like yeah. a oh, month really? before I came on. Right. Okay. Yeah, so, but all those times... All of the discussions were, oh, wow, this could be every single one. Mm -hmm. Well, in the four or five years that it has now been, it didn't happen that way. And then you had a lot of the concern for the businesses, which I didn't want to set them up for failure, that if they're going to make mistakes, you know, I don't want to give them the yes vote because people were saying, well, I'm not going to. Uh, support that establishment anymore. Free market, people are free to do whatever. None have gone out of business for that. And I think that goes to because it hasn't been over the top, in your face, right here, ding, 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 yeah. that it all of the precautions that are put in place about the screening, about the areas, mm -hmm. those have had the mitigating effect of not appearing that it's everywhere. Then you've had all the businesses. There are, yes, 30 restaurants that could have afforded it to put it in, but they haven't, and they haven't made those decisions lightly, I'm assuming, because they could have put it. They, they chose not to. At some point, we have to let business do their own business and kind of manage it that way. A lot of the concerns that we had... Um, did appear to be unfounded, or at least did not become as overwrought as it was. I see that, you know, people are saying, well, I'm not going to go to Riverside. And again, that could be, where do you save them from saving that versus the other people that are complaining about, well, I didn't like the taste of their pan pizza. You know, do, you, do I say, well, now you've got to have the different kind of recipe. Uh, they should be able to succeed and fail on their own based upon what the law allows. And if it gets to a point where, you know, a lot more of these businesses start bringing it in, there's going to be so many out there where people aren't going to be able to go to all of them. So owners are going to be like, it's so saturated we're going to pull it out. It's not for us. Mm -hmm. And that could be why some of the business owners, I mean, who knows why business owners haven't done that. And, you know, Marty <laughs> brings up a good point. Let the owners manage their business. It's not any different than, you know, I look at it as um, playing darts, going to a darts <laughs> and throwing darts. I mean, that's a game that you're playing. You're putting money into it. Same thing as pool, you know, and a lot of people do side bets with pools, you know. And you see that. And you go into a lot of these establishments, and it's not in your face. It's, you know, it's hidden. And half of the time, I don't even see people sitting using them. Probably the only place I haven't been to is the truck stop. I haven't seen what goes on there, but all the other establishments, people aren't readily using them. I know the part that we did with the, um, with the change of discouraging it was when we went from the $25 per machine <laughs> up to a thousand. thousand. And I mean, that, that has to weigh into whether, because that went to um, whether or not the business owners are going to put them in and people aren't sitting at them. That's a thousand dollars. They're just sitting. And again, right. the, the business decision is, does the dartboard or the pool table or whatever it's replacing the, the, the seats at the bar or the seats at the, the tables, that they have to remove to be able to put those machines in, does it make them more money than having mm -hmm. the other table? Right. You know, the four tables or the booth in the back corner where they put it or the other room that they located in that, you know, was a storeroom or whatever it ended up being that the new space 
gets, you know, for the machines, that has to be their decision. You know, and I'm sure if they put in the machines and they don't make the money that they think they were losing, they're going to come out. Yep. Anybody else? Anybody from would, the audience? I would just, I would add, uh, you know, as you know, I'm not a fan myself and, and would not have, have not supported expanding it. But uh, having seen what uh, Kevin's shared with us, um, and we just talked about revamping the liquor code, uh, liquor licenses, um, I think um, keeping as much control as possible mm -hmm. uh, to prevent these worst case scenarios happen. Um, I think that's, that's where I think is, is reasonable at this time as much as I think I would agree with Mark. I'd like to see it not exist. It, it does. Um, but uh, having no, uh, maintaining as much control as, as possible and through the liquor code seems to be the way to go. That's what I, I think the direction we should go. I'd be at peace with that if we added whatever we want to add to the liquor code when we're doing the revamp on it. I think that's the, the right time to do it. Anybody from the audience want to address this on this tonight? Okay. Uh, Come on up. Dahlstrom, um, uh, 419 South Forest Avenue. Uh, we quit going to establishments if they have video gambling in it because my wife and I are, have been against it the whole time. So, And we encourage other people to quit going to it too if they, if they feel the same way as we do. So I figure... Money talks, and it, you put your put your money where your your talk is. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, do we want to just leave it and have Kevin look at that change going with the liquor code update? I'm okay with that. Yeah. See a squint over here. <laughs> Mark, do you want to pursue it any further? Or well, as far, I do, but uh, well, I know you. Can, <laughs> I mean, do you want to propose anything or? Yeah, Mark. What What were you trying to accomplish? Were you looking for a sunset? I'd like to sunset it. I mean, I'd like to prohibit it and then grandfathered in. Those that have it, they have it, and if those businesses eventually go out of business, then. They're not, it's not transferred to anybody. Those obviously liquor licenses and the gambling licenses are not transferable anyway. So it wouldn't eliminate it in town. It would just, because mostly established businesses are doing it right now. Um, and that would, you know, the, the revenue is still there. We're not taking anything out of anybody's pocket. And, um, but it would just stop it from proliferating because I, that's, that's my fear is based on conditional use, there is nothing that we can really do if five more restaurants fill in downtown and those five restaurants decide we're going to do it. It's, it's the signage it's the, that, that bothers me. It cheapens the town, I think, a little bit um, when I see those. I, I, every time I drive down and I see the signs on Bulldog uh, Cellar, it drives me nuts. It just drives me nuts. That is like right in the heart of downtown. And we're going to see more of those. And there's not a lot... That we can do to stop the signage either so it's um I, the the whole idea of gaming and and ironically enough i will be in las vegas in a handful of days and i will take a limited amount of money to do it as an entertainment and i get it it's entertainment um i feel i can afford to do it so i'll do what i can afford to do I think, unfortunately, sometimes what ends up happening, and this goes to the mayor's point, that they want to put these near retirement homes, they're on a fixed income. It's people that, that least can afford to do it that get stuck in it. There's a reason for having 800 numbers to call if you have an addiction, is these things are, they are an addiction. And I, I will be honest that 20, however many years ago, when I first moved to Chicago and I went to Hammond with, with some friends, 
I was that I was on the verge of addiction because I went and I had money and then I'm like, oh, that didn't work out the way I wanted to. And I went and I withdrew some more money. That didn't work out the way I wanted to. And I did it again. And it was at that moment that like I got back to my apartment. I'm like, oh, crap. The next few weeks are going to be tough because I'm not getting paid for a few weeks. And I just took away all my disposable income. And I stopped and I didn't go into a casino for 20 years after that. And that's what happens. And we're doing that to our own citizens. We're taking money out of citizens' pockets. And we're putting it in other citizens' pockets that own these businesses. I get it. But that's tougher for those people that are going into these places. So, But I don't, I don't think the restaurants are building to, with the intent of putting in these machines to take the money away. What the mayor was referencing was just a shop, just to have these machines with a little you know, beer cooler in the corner. And that's not, you know, with the way that we're going to design everything through the ordinance, it's not going to be set up that way. It's not, it's not going to, their goal is not to take advantage of the old people and their disposable income or their, their the little income that they have to spend. I, I think that's debatable. I'm not saying, um, <clears throat> There are, and I remember, and I'm surprised they haven't come back before us, the Denny's, they wanted it because they wanted it. They asked for a liquor license early on because they wanted it. Now, they haven't come back to us and asked us for it. I'm not sure why. A little surprised. But I built a restaurant. I got a liquor license for the purpose of having gambling machines because I know it's going to raise another fifty, sixty thousand dollars in $60,000 in the revenue that they get out of it per year. So it's. It's no different, frankly, than a liquor tax or anything like that. I mean, we're, we're getting revenue off of it, and these are all, you know, it's the, it's the famous syntax. I mean, all these things that people, it's, it, again, whether or not somebody's out there intentionally doing that, trying to take money from somebody, I mean, that's, that's being a business. You're, you're out to make a profit, and I want to make more of a profit, so I do something that gets me more profit. So, I've got a question for Kevin. If we don't do anything with the existing ordinances that we have, and somebody comes before us and meets all of the conditions, is there any repercussion if eight of us say no? Yeah, there probably is. Um, and that, that kind of gets to the point of, you know, they have to obtain a zoning spe uh, conditional use, <clears throat> which becomes the entrance for the council to possibly say no. but. Um, the no is supposed to be uh, a no that's related to zoning, and that's the problem. So if the if the you know if there's discussion about it, and the reason the no vote occurs is because we don't want more video g gaming, that's not a legitimate z zoning uh, criteria. That's the problem. So um, there there is another way to come at this again this could be through the liquor code which you know there is no right to have a liquor license it's a uh, and and some communities Batavia hasn't been one of those communities but right next door North Aurora actually um limits the number of each type of liquor license so that if somebody wants another D liquor license the liquor commissioner can't hand one out because there isn't one available so they have to come before the village board and ask for the village board to increase the number of d liquor licenses in order for one to be given out that could be an approach again we've never done that in batavia i don't did. i don't think you're i think we used to because when okay. i first got well, on the council never we, since i've been i don't i don't we used to i've have never to given anybody a liquor license in this town in 39 years that didn't come before this council i don't believe our code limits the number and maybe it used to i think it used to yeah, limit it, it because i did. think when i first got on here we would have we'd have somebody that would would lose a liquor license mm -hmm. And then, without having to vote to increase the number, we would transfer it to say somebody bought the business. Right. And then, when the new business started and came in for a new liquor license, mm -hmm. 
we had to increase yes. the number of licenses. Okay. So that was before my time. Yeah. Yeah. But we you, don't it, have that. You should put that back in, as far as I'm concerned. Well, in, in, in <laughs> essence, you, you've kind of been the gatekeeper I'm to that gatekeeper, extent. But if we need to have it in writing, we can put it in writing because it's a little bit of a pain because the code changes every time. But the codifiers have to do that. So the other thing I would point out is that if there are two or three restaurants out of the more than 30 restaurants, and I think we have 60-some liquor licenses, is that correct, Chief? That is correct. So we already have 60-some potential businesses <clears throat> that might satisfy the requirement for video gaming now. Putting a cap on it, if, if you're putting a cap on it in order to prevent proliferation, it might not be the yeah. right method to do that. A little twist on that is that the liquor code could say how many liquor licenses Can are be associated with video games. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we're not limiting the number of each type of liquor license. We're simply limiting the total number of liquor licenses for which video gaming is allowed. Mm -hmm. That could be a way to deal with right. it. Said it as per, like a percentage of the total liquor licenses or a raw, a raw number. Or a raw number. If you create <laughs> this situation with. with the existing businesses where, and, and this happens anytime you grandfather <coughs> something, you're saying you, you know, we're giving you an extra advantage that we're not giving to new businesses who are coming into our community. And I mean, it's just a, a value right. judgment that we right. need to make, but I'm not sure if we want to do that. Right. And new businesses will make their own decision, but I think it's really, to me, a bad position to be as a city to say, Okay, you're a business that's been here for 20 years. You get to do what you want. But you're a new business. You don't have that option. You only get half the options that the old business get. I wish we had 20 restaurants knocking on our door to come into our town. <laughs> <coughs> that would be awesome. But we do have more senior living coming to this town. And I find that concerning. Yeah. If not, I'll, keep in control. Right. And I'll say something with regards to that, Tony. There's a lot of senior citizen centers that do have days at the boats, yep. days at the races, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's their biggest event of the year. That's what they like to do. Yeah, yeah, and I get that, and they have every right to do that. Right. But when I see someone preying on that, that's the yeah. issue I have. Yeah. And that the, the kind of business the mayor talked about that. <laughs> I watch that very closely because I I've already had it. They come in and yes. I told you Randall and Fabian they want to get on that corner because of what they see there. I've, I've had, since we implemented this, I've had maybe five phone calls from different uh, companies of exactly the same sort. When I explained to them our policy, um, some have hung up on me and not even <laughs> said goodbye. Some are a little bit more cordial than that, but the conversation absolutely stopped there. I think and that's why at the end of the day I'm okay with it because of those safeguards mm -hmm. that we have put in place because to otherwise make that next step in trying to peel it back or anything based on not wanting to allow someone to spend their disposable income where is that our responsibility to do that and at what point are we then becoming uh, some sort of organization that's passing moral judgments on people um, that, that I think, to Mr. Dahlstrom's point, that is what should be taking place. If people don't want to see something that is a lawful business in the community, they should say so, and they should not support those places if there's enough places then it goes away that's a community value judgment to substitute that for our personal opinions about what is or isn't well there could be shoe stores in town you might be spending a little too much in shoes and i don't want your disposable income <laughs> being spent that way come on eh? Well, you no, don't have to. I wish I did. You don't have to go as far anymore to walk into the city, so you don't wear your shoes out as much. <laughs> but the the thought that we then have to why not, why aren't we having the same conversation then about limiting liquor? That 
has societal impacts, has DUI impacts, has all the same social impacts on those things, but we have safeguards and try to find that balance where you protect people without controlling people. You got to have personal responsibility. Just about to say that that's the same thing that I brought up when we talked about dispensaries. Is it has to, at some point it has to be about personal responsibility. We have all the laws we could make, and it still has to be about personal responsibility. Mark. So I guess to that point, why do we restrict anything? Um, why don't we go for a casino? We are restricting. <coughs> we are restricting. No, I'm saying. In the way. Why do we not allow gentlemen's clubs? We do. Those on, are allowed in town. On 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 Wilson. But those are there's certain condi it's the same that we're talking. We're not saying yippee yay and start shooting the guns and it's the wild west. We have conditions and regulations that are put in place currently. And the what the fear that you're thinking was what everybody was saying four years ago. The same line of thinking. It didn't happen. So anything could happen. But it hasn't, and it hasn't because people are hanging up when they find out what our rules are. We don't have the gentlemen's clubs opening in the downtown because they're just not. What if a, what if a, um, a gay nightclub wanted to uh, open up in the downtown and that was a lawful use? Would we say yes or no based on moral judgments? Uh, you know, it's... You start walking a lot of fine lines when it's a lawful business following what the lawful zoning code is and start making exceptions to that. So maybe where we're at is that um, we may want to take a look at as we um, update our liquor code. We may want to look at ways that perhaps we can make it even more clear in order to avoid the pennies and bettys type of organizations to add that type of language, but that it sounds like there is not uh, a wish at this time to amend the video gaming provision that Title 26 of the business licenses. Is that correct? Feels that way. Uh, I think that's what Mark had originally proposed in talking about this was to limit the license or say no to it, ban it, but grandfather what's out there now. One of those two <laughs> options. Right? Am I correct correct. saying that? I think I like um, doing something with the liquor code and making it more difficult because I do, I've talked to my wife about this and about the way um, we can say yes or no to anyone based off of that. It puts us in a position um, for a business to say, why them and why not me? That, does that, that opens us up to some legal issues, doesn't it? Well, if if they have to come through the council to get a liquor license that allows video gaming, because we say there's only eight that are allowed at this present time, um, there is no right to a liquor license. Like there would be a right to a conditional use if you meet the factors. I mean, like well, right now there's yeah. not a limit. Correct. Mm -hmm. So not having a limit and us saying yes to someone and no to someone else yes puts us at That's risk right. as a city yeah. to potential lawsuit probably. Correct. Yeah, or if it's some arbitrary or if it's not based upon legitimate zoning factors. Right. right. <clears throat> okay. Any more questions? I believe that as it is. Well, we're gonna not necessarily it's gonna be Right, we're gonna add it we're gonna add that to the, the liquor code update to change or propose a change to that. And then we'll vote on that when we have a proposed chain in front of us. I've got a question about that. If we come up with, and we want to have a number, you, you mentioned if it's in the code, every time we, there's a change, and we, it has to be changed differently. 
We just took something out of a code earlier tonight and instead adopted a policy. Can the number be an adopted policy and not be in the code so that it would be easier? Yeah, to we're, we're actually data? talking about doing the opposite of making it from kind of this unspoken thing that we don't want to being a hard and fast number that's in the code. But with a resolution and a stated policy that would have a fixed number in it, it is a stated fixed number. Yeah, but I, I think you, you want, what I hear people saying is that you want this to come back to the council right. for the council to open the door or, or keep the door shut okay. on a per, you know, case by case basis. And that's what putting that number in the code would give you that ability. Thank you. Right, and I'm, I'm very confident that when I first got on the council, we had to, when we had a new business come in and apply for a liquor license, if somebody else hadn't surrendered one, we had to increase the number that were available. And I always think that was the, the, the regular restaurant licenses. That's why I, am, I cannot think of a time when a liquor license has ever been issued during my tenure that it hasn't come before this body to have a vote. Everyone. And you've got yeah. that discretion to say, I'm not yeah. granting one unless the council says it's okay. Well, that's been my that's, discretion. That's his procedure. Like, we mm -hmm. had someone come to council tonight to talk about the fact that they might be doing something. That's just been your, that's been your procedure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, to be honest with all our citizens, number one, they need to know that it's going before this body, and they're mm -hmm. making a concerted decision, a yay or nay, about what it is that they're doing, and this just isn't. Me sitting here with some power that I have saying, oh, I'll grant this one or I'll grant that one. I think that would be totally wrong and would be something that would not be well taken in this town. But I've never had that criticism before, that, or I've not had that criticism that somehow you're letting it in here. Because, I mean, this is a strong city council, weak mayor form of government by definition of the textbook. Because I don't vote unless half of you go one way and half of you go the other. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you're the power here making the decision as to what's going to really happen. And I'm happy to pass off that decision to all of you. And it's the way it should. I'm not happy is not the right word. I am <laughs> com comfortable doing that because you should be the ones making that decision. Okay. Are we comfortable with that? We will move on then to project staff. <coughs> um, just to let you know, at the uh, next plan commission meeting on March 4th, there's going to be some text amendments that are going to be on that agenda. Um, changes to the cannabis regulations to for a consideration of whether we would allow craft growing facilities. Um, also, the we recently had someone come in and ask for a variance as to industrial freestanding signs, the heights of those. And so uh, it was the 1850 oh, yeah. Fabian Parkway building. Um, so they're going to consider that. And then also the short term rental um, use requirements as well. So like Airbnb. We've been talking about those things for quite some time. And so those uh, text amendments will be going to the plan commission. Um, the logo is uh, becoming present in all of our electronic communications, um, as well as being used on our new vehicles that we are bringing online. Uh, tonight, many of you had an opportunity to see the new police vehicle with its uh, many new markings, but to include the new city logo. And it will also be applied to the public works vehicles that we have recently received. Um, just to give you an update on One Washington Place, um, and maybe people might be watching this video and, and not know some of the background, but um, we were recently informed in February by the developer that based upon the analysis um, of the financing for the um, project, that um, there does not appear to be enough time left on the TIF term. The TIF term, uh, we began the TIF in January of 2017, and so we are now three years later and we still have not yet begun construction. So um, it's expected that it's gonna take about three years until that project is, is fully built. And so in the fourth year would be the 
first year that we would get the increment, um, were significantly behind. And the reason for that delay, there were two major delays in the project. The first was back in 2017, in the summer of 2017, when the developer came to us and said that um, they discovered a significant um, error in the calculation of the cost of building the public parking deck because not only was it a subterranean um, floor of the, the parking, but it had to be built into bedrock. And because of that significant cost differential, um, there were negotiations over the redesign of the project to include uh, more revenue and reduce costs, as well as the proposal to remove the commercial spaces that were on uh, Wilson Street. We eventually did come to um, an agreement on a uh, restated redevelopment agreement that not only made changes to the composition of the building, but it also increased, um, whereas in the previous agreement, the city was providing $14 million in bonds for the project with the opportunity to do two million more later um, because of this cost issue that we ran into the city agreed to provide the 16 million dollars up do those bonds up front um, and we agreed to that and the parties moved forward the next responsibility in the redevelopment agreement was for the city to uh, begin to do demolition of the existing structures and then also to do additional environmental testing because we had to prove that we were providing them with a clean um, site and in doing that follow-up um, environmental testing in 2018 is when we discovered the presence of lead contamination on the site um, at that point um, we uh, knew that we would have to get a uh, remediation um, action plan approved by the IEPA. Um, but we also knew that we were in this position where if we were not going to get any construction done in 2018, that we were losing significant time on this project where we needed to figure out a way to save time. And the developer and the city um, came up with a plan where uh, the developer would be responsible for doing the um, remaining demolition and excavation on the site so that two of the same type of crews didn't need to be mo mobilized. You know, the city didn't have to hire demolition and excavation crew and then send those folks away and have the developer then come in when the site was clean and do the rest of their excavation and construction. Um, and so the developer took responsibility for doing all of that excavation and the city's environmental consultant would be testing the soils ahead of that excavation to determine which soils being removed needed to go to a special um, uh, waste facility and which could go to an ordinary construction debris um, facility. That took time, so we ended up um, in March of uh, 2019 was when we uh, came to that agreement and we had our second restated redevelopment agreements. And then in the course of the IEPA reviewing the uh, our request for an approval of our remediation plan, they came back and also asked for a groundwater plan. So it takes 90 days for the IEPA to approve these remediation action plans. And believe me, they take almost every one of those 90 days to get to it because of the backlog of work that they they have to get through so it was not until december 3rd of 2019 that the iepa came back and approved the uh, remedial action plan and until that point there's no assurity uh, that the construction was going to move forward. That's the point at which then the developer went out for financing and provided us with this analysis that says, based on the time that's left and the increment that we would expect to receive during the remaining uh, 20 years of this project, 
could only support probably a $12 million bond issue. So we've got this gap that we need to figure out how to address. Talked about three different alternatives. The first alternative would be to seek an extension of the TIF. The law allows the TIF period to be extended by up to 12 years. It requires the agreement of all of the other um, taxing bodies associated with the parcel. Um, the second option would be to create a new TIF that would have a new 23-year shot clock. Um, but the question being, would 23 years even give us the security we need in order to pay those bonds? I think it would be very close. And what it doesn't do is offer us any time to recoup the other reimbursable costs that the city alone has borne as part of this project, which would be land acquisition, the um, utility improvements that needed to be made in preparation for this project. And then the third would be the um, environmental remediation costs. So with a longer TIF time period, the additional increment would also allow us not only to make the bond payments, but also to uh, get reimbursement for some of those costs. Um, and then the third alternative would be to amend the project to a size that the remaining period of the existing TIF supports in, in terms of how much in bonds we would be able to issue at this point. And along with that, if we're going to do that kind of redesign, should we open that up to um, perhaps other suggested projects? Based upon the research that I've done thus far, and I know I said I was going to bring this back to you on March 3rd, um, but if city council is in favor of that project, that $40 million project that includes about $9 million, of which is a public parking um, garage. I think the best course of action would be the extension of the TIF. And I have had some preliminary conversations with um, the school district and the um, library district and other taxing bodies and uh, they didn't hang up the phone on me like some of those people who wanted to have bedding parlors. Um, so uh, I, you know, I cannot say how their boards would vote on that. Um, but our time is very short if we want to do that option. Um, it has to be done by an act of the state legislature. And um, so the spring session ends. May 29th, and the, the approvals of these other taxing bodies is done by resolution, so need to get in front of their boards in order to get such a resolution passed. So it'd be nice to be able to get at their March meetings to put together a packet that then could be sent to the legislature as early as possible in April to try to get this passed by the state legislature before they end their spring session. In the event that we're able to get this passed in the spring session, there's a possibility with a five to six month period wherein the construction drawings are being prepared and then subsequently reviewed by staff that we could get to the excavation part of the project yet in 2020, and then have a full construction season um, the following year. Um, but um, my question to city council is, if you are in favor of that project moving forward, and you would give me direction to try to extend this uh, TIF time period, my next step would be to prepare the city resolution um, approving the extension of that TIF period 
And my question to you is, do, when do you want me to bring that resolution to you if you want me to bring that resolution? I could bring this resolution to you as early as next Monday. Um, it could go directly to city council for you to discuss and determine whether you want to approve or not approve that resolution. I could bring it to the committee of the whole meeting next Tuesday, at which you could have a discussion and determine whether you want that to be sent forward to the next city council meeting, which would then be on March 16th. So that was a lot of information, um, but it's a complex issue. Um, but I'd just like to hear from you what you are, are feeling about it. I and I also, <laughs> um, the, developer, the developer will be here at the meeting next week, whichever you um, prefer. I recognize that this project um, limped its way to approval with 7 to 7 with the mayor approving it. I'm going to be out of town for the next two meetings, um, so I'm concerned about how strong that 7 to 7 is going to hold, and we've had some new people join the council. But since you told us about this, my, my gut reaction was I thought that extending the TIF was probably the right way to go if we still had an appetite to uh, let this project go forward. Um, I do recognize that I fought pretty hard for this project. I thought it was the right thing to do, having that um, increased number of residents in, in that space was going to solve a lot of problems that we had in terms of, of promoting retail and whatnot down, downtown. My biggest concern was, were, <laughs> was the narrative uh, that we had to write another check <laughs> to uh, show Dean. That does not sound like we're going to have to write them a check. What it no. sounds like is by changing the math, by changing the formulas, it's a lot of hoops to jump through, um, but we could, we could save this project. And then furthermore, I'm glad you brought this up, that we could recoup some of these. I forgot how much money we've spent. Um, and to be able to have all those extra years to be able to reimburse ourselves is that much more attractive to me. My big question is, Is I don't remember when the Metro West Lobby Day is. This is this something that we would lobby on while we're down there in Springfield? Would this be, we would be hiring a lobbyist to handle this for us, or do we believe that this would sail through? The reason I ask is, didn't someone just uh, advance legislation about yes <laughs> killing tiffs again i mean that's it's perennial it's but it's it's, per, it's perennial yeah, it's, but so the, this is also again. part of the context in which we are approaching this is that there is a senate bill right now which would shorten the tiff time period to 10 years with a maximum extension of 5 years so you can imagine the amount of bonds that could be supported yeah. within that time period from now on we're talking a lot smaller projects so the opportunity to do a 40 million dollar project in your downtown that door may be closing mm -hmm. i you know i don't i just don't know if that legislation will be successful or not but i would think we'd want to get it as quickly as possible then i that's where i'm thinking if we want that $40 million project, then I think the TIF extension is the way that, oh, and Mark and Scott behind you is. Yeah, and I think um, as to the extensions, uh, historically, and Chris can probably you know, echo in this too, but normally what they've done, as long as the districts have approved of them, they pretty much sail through as, as either a trailer bill or, or their own bill. In fact, there's at least two TIF extension bills that are in, in place right now. Mm -hmm. I think one's for Maywood and another one's for another western suburb. So, you know, it, it, it's, a nor it's relatively straightforward that they go forward, but, you know, TIF is always one of those things that has a target on its back, so you never know. Chris Aston? Come on up and use the mic, Chris. Binding the council is, is fact, but both TIF 1 and TIF 3 uh, 
were extended to the full 35 years. And if, for instance, the Walgreens project wouldn't have been a TIF project had we not extended it. Uh, and, and I would, would echo what was said. You know, a lot of TIFs get extensions because they're not being developed or they don't have enough time on a 20-year note bond. And so they go to the legislature. And in the past, there has not been real difficulties in getting TIFs extended. It's becoming more difficult because now you have to have written authorization from the other TIF districts. Mm -hmm. uh, to create a new TIF, you not, wouldn't necessarily do that, but I don't think that's the answer. I agree with what staff has indicated. What Laura said that I think the easiest way to get it done and gives us the most ability to pay ourselves back is extending it out to the full 35 years, which would the, the 20 the 23 year TIF, which you add the 12 to it, and that takes you out to I think 52, right? 30, well, the, the 52. 52. Yeah, 2052, which gives us all kinds of time and perhaps even more projects between now and then. And that's something that I wanted to bring up is that no matter what gets built, what gets built on that property generates the money that pays these bonds off. It's not coming from the general fund. It's not coming from anything else. It's coming from that property. And that's something that I've had to explain time and time again to people that have questioned me about what this project is or how it's funded. Um, so I think it bears you know, repeating again so the public knows that that this project is what creates that money that pays those bonds off. So it, it, extending that doesn't put more money in the developer's pocket, doesn't put more money back into the city without that project being built. So if we reduce the size of it or we do anything different there, I don't think we ever we will ever have the opportunity to build anything of that size with a TIF or get the public parking component of it that's involved with this one with any other TIF or any other project we do in town. Because I just don't see that happening. And I think it's kind of a gamble on what happens with TIF. I think this has happened many, many times where they've proposed this. Um, but I think there's also a lot of things that have changed over the last 10 or 15 years within the state that may affect that. I mean, there's a lot of things in Chicago. The Pullman District is mm -hmm. a great, you know, district that's been partially rebuilt with TIF. And that's really been, you know, the one that I can think of that's really big that's out there. Mark? I haven't had a lot to say tonight, so I figured I'd jump in on this. <laughs> um, I'm not in favor of extending the TIF, certainly not 12 years. Um, I just think that I understand the position he's in, and he's not going to make the money back in the time that the TIF exists. He's going to make money in the long it, run. It's, it's, just, it's really us. I mean, it's not. No, he's obligated. Enough. He's obligated through SSAs. No matter what, he's 100% obligated. That was, our, that was our way to protect ourselves. So he's going to make money in the project. It's going to take him longer to make back the money on rents if he has to build it under these conditions. I'm not going to extend. Um, I think he won't get financing. I think when they look at the fact that there's then, a financial cliff okay. in 20 years, I, I think the project will be over at that point as opposed to it being a matter of having to wait longer to make okay. money. Then, then at that point, I would say no because I wanted the retail. We lost the retail. I'd love to see somebody else come in and give us a project there with retail. And if it ends up being a smaller scale, it ends up being a smaller scale. There's other potential properties in town where people could build apartments, and I'm not willing. It's, this has gone on too long. He knew, as far as I'm concerned, it's a simple spreadsheet. He knew last year, early last year, that, it, oh, that's happening again. And my spreadsheet, I just added another year onto it, and I realized that I'm not going to make my money back and be two, three million dollars short. An extra year was not two or three million dollars. Um, there's no way. Um, so I'm not in favor of doing anything else with this. He can do it or he, he doesn't. Um, when this came to the first redevelopment modification, the first the cow that it was approved at was November 28th, 2017. You had asked, what if we just went out to a new developer and end it? We were told, Chris, I watched it, and we were told at that point, because the TIF is so 
heavy laden on TIF dollars, this project. If we lose a year or more, this project doesn't pay itself back. So this conversation should have happened January of 19 when the 7-7 vote actually took place in that new redevelopment agreement. Because that's where I looked at, based on the financials, based on making sure that we were going to pay it back, all of those things were what for what I was buying, I did not want to buy that new building. So I became a no. <clears throat> Where we are today, you would have to convince me that I would want to spend more time paying back something that I didn't want two and a half years ago. And that's where it goes for me, because when I had said, what new has changed? When we were told at that vote to modify the 14, the 16, to lose this, all of those factors considered, and we were told, well, if we lose a year, it's done. We should have, there should have been conversations at that point, but we were assured because the conversations with the developer were that he was going to make that increment up. I remember the, I watched the point where you had said that the discussions with Shodeen, with Kent and Dave were in the three years that it was being built. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were going to make that increment up even before increment was They was were going to make cash payments on the deficit in order to pay the bond payment. Which went to exactly why the only thing on some of the factors that I did my trade-off on my initial yes was that the church was being paid back for that purchase, which was written off years ago. This was a way to get that reimbursed to the city, which never had a vehicle for that. It was to get back all of the land, the remediation, all of those things and we have said over and over and over and over to the community about the belt and suspenders and the SSA and all of that where it wasn't going to cost the public anything right. and that's and we're protected and all of that absolutely. is still there and it was another year we lost a whole nother year at this point waiting for the two IEPA approvals and so you know there's the off ramp there that if the developer is unable to get financing, then that's that's an offer. No, and I know, and well. and that's where I'm saying that's why all of the the discussions that this could not have paid itself back should have been stated or had the discussion about the ask for extending the TIF in January of 19. Yeah. Um. Similarly, I was trying, after I calmed down a little bit from the first initial um, discussion around this or, or disclosure about where we're at with this, um, I started going through my own notes about this. And I thank you for the recap, but I do feel that was a sanitized recap. Um, this whole project has seen red light after warning light after yellow light, whatever you want to call it, multiple warnings along the way of change. What we lost, what was it, uh, 9,000 square feet of retail from the original design. Um, we ended up, uh, and again, I didn't support this, but we ended up increasing the amount from 14 to 16 million, losing parking spaces in the garage, um, which again, we're the owners of that, so we're extending the amount we loan, but getting less in return because mm -hmm. the parking garage is ours. Yep. Um, you know, th this has just seen um, one hiccup after another. Bedrock's in the in this area. I, I don't know how. Again, coming back to that one from when it was brought up as a, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? This is not news. Bedrock's in the area, folks. Um, I, I don't understand how. It, to, to Marty's point, um, as that was discussed back in, when it was, um, only now are we realizing that we're out of time. Um, you know, again, it, 
if the if I'm outnumbered on the vote again, fine, so be it. Um, I, I can live with that. But to me, extending the TIF after all these warning signs, red lights, whatever you want to call them, guess what? We're going to see another one. There'll be another delay, another problem. He took a lot of my thunder, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> three and a half years ago, Dave Petzel stood up there and we were debating about the cost of the land we were buying. And it was coming up to a million dollars. And he looked at us all and said, if I was looking at a $40 million project, $40 million project and it was a million was keeping me from it, I'd write the check. Well, he's looking at a 100-year project. If a year is going to keep him away from it, write the check. Since day one, there's an opposite correlation of time versus my trust in what they're doing. Everything they've done up till this point has diminished my trust in, in doing it. This town's been around 200 years. It'll be around 200 more, whether this project is here or not. We do not have to do this. We're not. Somebody else will come. It might be different. might be bigger. might be better. might be smaller. It, it, it doesn't. We, we are not pinholed into this, and, and you said it at the end. Something else is going to come up. I mean, he's proven it. I would say this is something else that I felt was going to come up the last time when I voted no. <laughs> this here, you know, I, I, I was ready to cut bait then, and, you know, quite frankly, um, you know, I, I might, there's nothing that's, that's changed my opinion from that. Uh, the last time I voted on this, so I'm, I'm I'm not in favor of keep dragging this on. Whether it's not might not be costing us more, but it's costing us more time, and it's costing the school district more time, and it's costing the library district more time. Um, time is money. Abby, have they shown any interest at all in the smaller project? Um less interest in that than building the original project. So they continue to be very interested in building the original project insofar as we're able to get the extension of time on the TIF. And if we did end up going with a smaller project in the future, um, in terms of the contamination on the land, do we clear up the contamination ourselves ahead of time? Or do the future developers have to do their chunk of it? Or does the whole place have to be cleaned up once? So the reason why um, the remediation is so expensive at this time <coughs> is because we are building a two-level public parking deck that goes so far down into the bedrock that all of the material on the site that is above the bedrock needs to be removed. One of the things that can be done um, with this type of uh, lead contamination is it is perfectly acceptable to encapsulate it. So if we were covering it with a layer of concrete, that would be fine and we could build up from there. But because we're doing that subterranean garage is why the remediation is so expensive. Does that uh -huh. so answer we, your question? Yeah. And if we identified another spot in town where we could construct a parking lot or a parking garage, um, a much more cost-effective development could go on this land. A much more? Well, the, we would eliminate the cost of needing to dig down into the bedrock, and we would have, eliminate the need to do so much remediation. Correct, but a lot of what you have over there on the redevelopment site right now is a public parking asset. So if you were to replace that with something that only parked itself, then you would be at a net loss for a lot of existing parking. And we have built the Larson Becker uh, former site as a public parking, but it was meant to be temporary um, until when Washington Place was built. So we would be eliminating a lot of downtown existing parking. And one other thing is keep in mind that the garage is being funded by the TIF and the increment that is generated by this development. So if we were going to build our own garage, we would be using TIF increment that really doesn't exist, I guess, at this point, unless it's funded by an actual project. <coughs> um, 
No, I'm not. Give me an opportunity to reiterate one point, which I think is important. One of the linchpin to this project is you get a public parking garage that on the exact same parcel you get X amount of money in an increment. Unless you find a project that's similar where you build the garage where you have a public <laughs> asset and then on the same parcel you build this increment producing project uh, because of the, the vertical subdivision, if you will, where the public asset is below the, the, the private asset. That's one of the, the reasons a project, from my opinion early on, uh, was such a desirable piece because it's not often that once you build a public garage, it also sustains a, um, a private development on the same parcel. So uh, you, unless you did a similar project within the TIF district that created both this public asset as well as on the same parcel, uh, the private development, you couldn't realize that you'd just be buying a parking deck that would be tax exempt on a piece of property. So I obviously have my biases <laughs> too against parking and cars because the, the, whatever the quote is that if you build for parking and traffic, then you're going to get parking and traffic. But if you build places for people in place, you get people in places. So the fact that a developer couldn't take what's already successful about that block being, you know, just the, the old, the old chunk of it, right? From river's river's edge around the corner to Bocaditos and just want to build that, just replicate that. It's, it's, is it 100% leased right now, that whole section right there, and doing fine, those businesses there, and just put it on the other corner and replicate that, that we couldn't, that we couldn't do that because we're, we're so um, hamstringed by the need to put so many parking spots down there? That's, that's just bothersome to me. I know that's a whole other debate, and we're getting into the weeds <laughs> of this, and it's 10 o'clock, so. <laughs> and, but. and replicating those buildings is not creating a million dollars in increment like that. Was million dollar increment Every like the forty million dollar one? Yeah. To to fund what? To fund the parking garage, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But if we didn't, if we and and creating two hundred residences in our downtown, which are the customers mm -hmm. for the businesses, and I don't know what the motivation for those new businesses that came and decided to make that investment there, but. I'd assume that part of it was the expectation that that project was coming. But to Abby's point, five years has changed, and a lot has changed. That was the only available spot to do a big development at that time and to put 200 people. There's nothing saying that 50 couldn't go there. Mm -hmm. More can go on. Larson Becker was not available at the time. That came up since then. That is now under our control. We can do the intention of what we wanted to do with that was premised on that mm -hmm. happening. Well, if that changes, our thinking on Larson Becker can change too. This is a time to be nimble in thinking differently and creatively because then there's the chase parcel, which was not open within the, the last five years. You put another couple hundred, or not a couple hundred people, but you put a hundred or so people in a development there. Now you're getting density but it's going to be a it's not concentrated density you're still having people and actually it probably would be better in smaller developments which would then go more towards the fitting of the character mm -hmm. which has always been the sticking point <coughs> those parcels weren't available they're available now you put more scalable developments in there you can have the same amount of people it won't feel like it though Okay, I'm not sure I have heard anyone speak tonight in favor of extending the TIF. One, <laughs> two, exactly. no, three. I, I would just like to ask a question. Sure. If we two. extend the TIF and the project doesn't go forward, any ramifications for that? No. Okay. And then now that we know that there is remediation that needs to be done, can we just leave it there? I mean, I don't know if that's being responsible if this doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Until it's disturbed yes. to do okay. some construction, I mm -hmm. don't think there's any issue with leaving no. it alone. Okay. Mm -hmm. 30 cap. And, and I think yeah. that's one of the things that, regardless of where we go with this project, I feel like if we don't extend the TIF and the TIF rules change, we're really going to hamstring ourselves for anything to be done on that property. Because say we say no to this. Say this falls apart and it's done. 
and it takes us five years to get back around to get a shovel in the ground to do something. The amount of time that's left on that TIF doesn't give us a lot to be able to invest back into that block. We give him 12 guarantee that it's not going to happen in the five years. We've just given five, 12 more years. It, there's no guarantee that it's really going to happen right. in the next and, five and what years. I, what I'm saying is if we don't do this project, if we don't do one Washington place and we leave the TIF as is, by the time we get another developer or any, you know, whatever else is next on that property, the TIF is that much shorter. So regardless of whether or not we move forward with one Washington place, I think we should extend the TIF. Yeah, we can that's dissolve. what I was getting at. I think that's I think our that's only option doing, at yeah. this point, no. whether we go forward with this project or not. I, I could be convinced of that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not against TIF as a construct, right? right? I mean, I, I know there's arguments <laughs> out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to my, to my thinking, though, um, One North Washington is not a reason to extend this TIF. If we want to talk about extending the TIF, that's... To me, a separate conversation. I understand it's a part of this conversation for mm -hmm. that reason. Um, I'm not against extending the TIF. I don't think we should extend the TIF for One North Washington, though. That's my only. Well, then I think we have to have the developer in here, and we have to have that conversation. I was, I was just thinking we need, we need to have someone come in here, and is there a way we can create a timeline to where if you don't start this project by this time, we can move on to something else. Well, that was two years yeah, ago. Yeah, that was two years ago. That was November 2017. The reality of it, it was, it was two years ago. The timelines in the RDA right now already can't be met. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. we and do I, have the ability to say. I've dealt with enough um, developers in my professional career before here to know that if you want to build something, you get it started. Like the fact that it, 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 is, it has changed so many times tells me they really don't want to do anything. I have dealt with people that have come across bedrock and um, soluble, wa just water issues at the basements of things. And you're, there was the, the developer or contractor is responsible for those things. And they should be starting this project and they should have been already going. Now, but they can't because of the environmental issues, and those were always the city's responsibility in the RDA. So they haven't been responsible since early 2018 when we did the demo and the follow-up environmental But now, you told me now they've come back with, they have bedrock issues, but I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the main things you, you bore for from the beginning. So, that, that was back in 2017. So that, that issue they So they knew that right was coming, away. but... Saying no to him and then having the conversation of extending the TIF so that whatever project comes, developer comes after this, we can have that stuff paid off, our part of it. We need to have that conversation. But I think it's less likely that the other taxing bodies are going to agree to give the city approval to extend the TIF. If, if we don't do this to save this project, because right now they know that with this project, they are getting a million dollars in increments at the end of that time period. Um, so what could happen if we don't do this project? If, in, for instance, this project took 11 years to land, maybe another project won't take 11 years to land. But during that period of time, it's you know, the increment that's being generated is all being captured by the city. And, you know, this is TIF used in the wrong way, where you only continuously use it for public um, amenities mm -hmm. that the city is building. Um, and it doesn't result in increments that, at the end of TIF, other government entities get to share in that additional mm -hmm. increment. So. Without a guaranteed project, it is probably going to be hard for me to sell the other government entities on extending the tip. But what, I, what I'm hearing is that I probably shouldn't be bringing this directly to city council, but maybe we should have the developer come in next Tuesday and have the conversation about, you know, maybe step one is whether we want to continue with this project or not. And then step two is, do we want to go after an extension of the TIF? 
or do you want to flip these decisions for some reason? Am I missing? Well, I, I guess one thing that I want to, and I want to ask the developer this, because I think this is something I brought up before, is the SSA was put in place when we did the RDA to allow for any deficiency in the amount of time or any deficiency in the amount of increment that was created to be made up by that SSA. Mm -hmm. Is it because they don't think there's any way that that SSA can be enough even if it's instituted the day they start construction on it until the day it's paid off. I mean, I guess that's my feeling is that if you were to take the SSA and put it in and say it added $1,000 a year, $1,200 a year to every rent that's in there, and that's what it took to make up that SSA money to make up the TIF diff or the, the increment difference, because that's what it's for. In the years the TIF is in place, <laughs> you're right. But if the TIF ends and we still owe a bond payment, mm -hmm. it's about $5,000 extra on the tax bill for each unit. See, and that's, that's what that's I think. Cliff. That's what I think the reality is of this is that the developer looked at that and finally realized that that SSA is a deal breaker because if you have to add that on to each and every unit in that Everybody's property, there's no way you're going to rent those. There's no way you're going to sell those if that's hanging out over every unit in it. Too expensive. It, it yeah, so I guess the onset of the project. Yeah. Right, and and I understand that they did, but um, we had off ramps uh, in the RDA, and they had off ramps in the RDA, and one of those was always right up front the developer's ability to secure financing for the project. That so that's been in there since day one. So since day one, they knew they were going to come back at the time of financing and ask for something else. I don't think that they could have anticipated that it would take the better part of two years to to uh, address an environmental issue that neither party knew about. But that's my point about in those the two years, 2020 and 2019 and 2019 2018. and 18 it was a known because we knew that if that year ended without shovels in the ground it couldn't pay itself back yeah, that's we had, what we were told yeah. when well, it was i agree time to make that yeah there, there was probably an earlier period of time which had somebody been keeping track and and continuously updating that that spreadsheet that calculates that there was a crossover point that but was missed because that wasn't analyzed until well, he went to go see that finance. was that was the that was the argument that was presented to us as to why we needed to vote on the redevelopment, the, re, the first reamended redevelopment agreement was because the RDA or the TIF did not pay itself back if there was a year delay or more. Mm -hmm. In November of 17, that was mm -hmm. stated, and that was what guided our votes on that. And I, that can't be... I all Overlooked I can say as is you're right. Two years, you're absolutely right. But here we are today, so it, and we just need to decide yeah, if we want to do that project. We need to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. If we've decided we are no longer interested in that project for whatever reason, if we're not going to go forward with that project, mm -hmm. then we're probably not going to get an extension of the TIF period, and it's going to be a much different project. So. I think those are the, the choices. Yeah, and I guess we, there's that off-ramp of he, he can't get financing. But he, mm -hmm. he could get financing if he asked for less money in his financing. He's, I'm confident that he has money that he could oh. make his, sure. his loan less <clears throat> and fit it into that time. I'm fairly confident that the guy's got a lot of buildings that he's building around town and other towns right now. So... Sure, he, but he could do it, and it, it's it goes to Keenan's point. Either he wants to build it or he doesn't, mm -hmm. and so there's this part of me that's like, yeah, he doesn't want to do it, and or he wants to do it, but he wants another five years to do it, and then he sits on it for another five years, and then eh, you know what? It's not financially feasible for me at all, so I'm done. And now we've wasted a ton of time. Or he wants to do it, and he's ready to start, but he wants a little bit of extra time to be able to pay it off with an assessment rather than an SSA, by the increased value of the property rather than an SSA that, that we signed in later. So before it was without an SSA, then we added the SSA. 
So no, SSA was there was from, it from the very SSA beginning. Was it from, okay, what we I'm added sorry. in was he yes. was going to make the cash payments okay. in the early years <laughs> because there was no increment coming in and there's no increment on a public parking. Okay, uh, my misunderstanding. But either way, I think that he's he could make it happen, mm -hmm. and he's making a choice that he wants more time to make it happen. So he just makes money. It takes him longer to make his money. <clears throat> just to chime in because I think it's only fair <clears throat> to consider. We can all individually speculate on what his profitability line is and when he thinks I'm going to walk away because I can't make any money. But, and I have, as you know, a pretty good history with the company. And I will tell you that Shodin undertake no matter how much cash he's got and how much collateral he can put up, all of his projects are leveraged. They don't, they're, when you're that big of a company, this goes without saying, really, there's opportunity cost. And so if he can keep cash to do more projects, he can make more money than interest he'll pay. So if the, the interest rate is 5%, he's still going to want to borrow the money he, he wants to borrow because he's going to make potentially more money than 5% as a return investment by using the cash on hand, <laughs> which is why their business model involves leveraging. And I think he told us that from the very beginning, that it was going to be a leveraged project. The company could probably build this project today with cash, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I don't know that to be true, but they, it, but there is an issue about borrowing money. There's no question about it. No, no, I, I agree. It's, so I'm not. I, I, it's, I don't think it's fair to necessarily say he'll put it off and put it off. Uh, but believe me, we as a staff, we were all concerned that do you really want this project? And I think the way to talk about it perhaps is include in the whatever redevelopment agreement we have to amend. If in fact you want to proceed with that project, we do insist on dates, and that we. Right now, we've had dates in the, in the pro program, but he's had some kind of force majeure out of those things because things have happened that are out of control. Now I think we have a good idea of what is all involved. I don't know what other mysteries will be will come up. I know I, you're skeptical. I get it. I get it. Why did you say that? But I'm just saying, you know, we, we think we got our arms around and we have an approved amended RAP redevelop, or remedial action plan. We've got that in hand. Um, we do know what we have information, the geotechnical report as to where the bedrock is. He adjusted his pricing on on, um, on the garage then. The one thing that's not working in our advantage, actually, is the cost of labor and the cost of wood. And it, that could make things worse. Mm -hmm. You know, the longer he waits to pull the trigger on drawing the contract documents with respect, or at least the construction plans, and then going out to bid it, the longer that wait period could make it worse for him. Uh, the only other comment I'd make is that I don't see a downside to extending the TIF to 12 years, whether this project goes away or not, especially if the taxing bodies seem like they might be willing to do it. Now, they may change their mind if this project goes away. There's, I mean, there's good reason to believe they might. To speak to one other point you made, I think it was you, Mark, is uh, I don't mind an extension necessarily. Perhaps that, that's too favorable. You said I'm less concerned about a 12-year extension than if we made it perhaps lesser. And we could consider that. We could write in an agreement that with the other taxing bodies that they required that we will expire the TIF voluntarily, and which you can do even though it's a 12-year extension. You can always bail out early. And you can expire the TIF when the bonds are paid off. You can expire the TIF when the bonds are paid off and the city's paid back completely. I mean, that's an option. Back and the, and the bonds are paid off. We could say we're done. The tiff's over. Everybody gets their money. You know, every other. Okay, maybe I can. not No, I'm not. I, I just, <laughs> I, I'm not commenting on that. I, there, there's just one thing I I want to uh, focus in on a little bit. So, at at this point, we there's off ramps. You mm -hmm. uh, there were there were, there have been off ramps for the city. Off ramps for Shodine. We haven't taken any off ramps. We've said we've stayed on the ramp with Shodine up to this point. Um, <clears throat> my understanding is that that the the um, my memory of the RDA is that Shodine has the say that we want to go forward. So we're ready now. Mm -hmm. We're poised. We right. have what we need. Shodine can say, "Okay, I want to go forward," but he's saying, "No, wait a minute, stop." My only point in bringing this up is that, and, and this is way oversimplifying things, but the person who takes the off-ramp can get stuck with some costs here. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to be the one taking the off-ramp. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have to agree to 
change anything. We don't have to agree to extend or to modify the agreement that we've got. But I, I don't think we want to be pulling a plug that would cause us to incur costs. That's all. Right. That's my only. Yeah, opinion. and that's why I'm yeah. saying either he does it yeah. or he doesn't. <clears throat> right, and I think Nick's suggestion is right. We have him up here and say either you write the check or move forward or you say no. <coughs> one, one of those. And at that point, after we have a developer in front of us, then we make our decision. I'm not going to be here next week to witness this. Are we literally asking him for a check? No. <laughs> what, what, what are we going he's, to... He's got to make his decision. I'm serious. What he, are we asking for at this are meeting? Are you asking him to commit to building the project? <laughs> yeah. Because he's told us he can't he, do that. He can't do that without the TIF extension. And so we are, what, not, what he's we are saying not required is, to extend the TIF. We are not oh, no, required we're not. to. We're we not. all so have an off ramp right now. Play right. that out. Or, or to he agree. will come back and do. say, yeah. if you are not able to extend the TIF, um, then and you are not willing to talk about uh, re redesigning the project so that it there's sufficient funds to pay a bond issue, then he'll say, then I'm unable to get financing for this project, which then it would be his off-ramp he's taking, and that'll alleviate us of the liability. Yeah. But so if he comes in mm -hmm. and says, I really want to build this project, and if you're willing to extend the TIF, let's go build this I'm thing. just saying philosophically, we have an off-ramp. We should probably take that off-ramp at tonight's meeting unless we acknowledge at the very next meeting he thinks he's going to do, or we think he's going to do something we know he's not going to do. Why so are we wasting that's where no, Kevin's, that's where Kevin's no, 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 comes no, in, is that we process. will incur re, uh, we'll expenses that we have to, to reimburse him for <coughs> I think so putting him in the box that. is what we, we need. So what right. about, right. what about him taking the off ramp? What yes. expenses do we have? We don't if he takes the off ramp. That's, we need to so that's why this happens in that manner. Even regardless of that, how much have we put out? How much have we invested in this and making this happen? Oh, How gosh, I put that number together for a FOIA like two and a half years ago, and I don't well, remember what that number is. Peggy, do you remember? We bought some buildings. About two and we still don't know how yeah, much. Yeah, apart from the real estate we bought. A couple million dollars, call it. And, and but, yeah, no. but, but we still own that, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. that parcel. So, I, you know, not not the long. real estate that we bought, but all the staff time and the no. legal time and the, <laughs> all of this. <laughs> how much <laughs> money we <laughs> put into and this and how much has he put into it? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that's. Yeah. He's creating us to spend the money <coughs> with coming A back lot of that and money was saying spent that he can't front. do stuff. The original purchase of the Baptist Church yeah. was was not even included yeah, was, in this no. mm -mm. because that wasn't for this originally. The job, the purchase, and you could even say the demo mm -hmm. because that was always the intention. Of that's what <coughs> gets lost. That mm -hmm. the four hundred thousand and the demo was always a part of it. But I think the question, well, it was asked of us: Is it time to pull up the big boy pants? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. I mean, and we I were asking. The, so the balls in their the court. That's what I want to. That's why I want. What I want to know. Yep. I mean, they have to make the decision because I, I'll tell you right now. I don't want to see decision? us come. Whether or not they're going to go forward with this, they are willing to go forward with it as long as we want to go forward with seeking the extension. And I mean, he he will come here next week and he will say exactly that. That's what he's been telling. But we have an RDA that's a, that says look, that they have to build that. If they can't perform and they can't get financing, he has to back out of the deal. Right. right. Yes. That's the end. Let, of the let him come. Yes. Let him. So that's and he, he still could, that. even after if he comes on Tuesday and he said, "I really want to build this project," and then we say, "Okay," um, then we will extend this TIF, and we go and we do all the work to extend the TIF, and in the meantime, he's going out for financing, and no one will loan him the money for it. Then he has an off ramp, even though he wanted to move forward with the project, and we were willing to extend the TIF. If he can't find somebody to loan the money for the project, that's his off ramp. And even then, he finds somebody to loan him the money to build the project. <coughs> and the project goes out to bid, and the bids come back, and it's a significant 
more cost than was expected, developers off ramp. The project does not get built. So, I mean, this these are yeah, we need a different developer. <laughs> yeah. So here's we, here's the thing. Answered our question. We're, we're, when you look at what things looked like back in uh, 2016, when the first redevelopment agreement was being signed, things looked a lot different. <coughs> we had um, a piece of property that uh, the city had purchased in order to fix the jog on 25, and then it was found that that project was no longer feasible. Um, that land that sat there for the next 11 years. The first thing that was done was, well, try to sell the First Baptist Church. Well, the study was done to see what would need to be done to bring the building to code. Three and a half million dollars. Do you remember what that building looked like? Mm -hmm. No one would be willing to invest three and a half million dollars in order to bring that building back up to code. So it was, let's find a developer who's willing to redevelop the site. In 2014, um, we hired Chris, and he st put together a request <coughs> for proposals. He sent it out to two dozen different developers, and not one of them brought back a project. It wasn't until he reached out to Shodin that we ended up with this project. So that was what the landscape looked like back when we created this redevelopment agreement. So when you see things in it that uh, show a very different negotiating position between the, a city and a developer, a lot of those issues were probably why. And this wasn't the only project. There were three iterations. One of them showed like 14 townhomes. Yeah. And we said, no, let's go for the parking deck. Mm -hmm. Honor. Yeah, uh, just an observation. Uh, last Friday, as I told you earlier, I went into a meeting of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, and I was approached by a fellow mayor who says to me, Jeff, I hadn't been in Batavia in about 14 years. He says, I came to your town last week, and I was blown away by what I saw in your downtown. He said, I saw all these businesses that were appearing in all those old storefronts, and they've all got new faces to them. And he says, what's been done on the Fox River in downtown Batavia is just dynamic, and you've got this whole thing open for public. You've got the bike trails. He says, you've rebuilt a couple of those streets. He says, you've laid a golden goose out there, or a golden egg, I guess is what he said. Uh, and you're downtown, he says, and what a redevelopment opportunity you've created there for some neat things to happen in the years ahead. He says, I'm going to predict that downtown Batavia is going to be the place of action in the next five to ten years in western suburban Chicago, he says, just given what you've put into place. So, you know, given our ten, ten, temperament <coughs> of conversation we've had here tonight, I guess I would, you know, encourage that we all go home and kind of sleep on it and think about what it is that we got here, because I think we do have something special. We have an opportunity to really set Batavia up for the next 100 years as something of very good quality, whether it's this project or it's another project, that certainly is up to the vision and wisdom of the city council. But many of you sitting here and some of your predecessors who are no longer sitting here who have been here in the last 12, 14 years who helped put all this together and helped build the river walks and the bike trails and everything else, you know, it's, it's finally, I think, the moment's coming when we're going to realize some really strong benefit from it. And it's going to be something that the community is going to have a lot of pride in. So I, I hope that we don't end this conversation tonight in a moment of bewilderment and dismay that we don't know what we're going to do here because at the end of the day as they was told the other day we got a golden goose on our hands and we're going to be able to do something very special whether it's this or something else and and i would agree with that and when the request for proposal was 2016 <coughs> 20 14, 14, 14. 14. So we're talking six years ago. A lot has happened here. Uh -huh. Might be interesting to That's see. That's what I was saying. It's a different might landscape. Be interesting for that request to be put out again at this time. Yep. They said that he hadn't been here in 14 years. Mm -hmm. He said he was just blown away by the positive redevelopment culture that had been put into place here. And he says, obviously, you've got a lot of vacant land there that hasn't had anything happen to it. But he says, with that river and the dynamic views, he says, I stood on the east bank of the river and I looked over at the city hall building and saw this neat little old factory that had been put back into very practical use. And he says, I had people walking across the bike bridge and biking and walking. And he says, 
River Street. He says there's just a lot of factors here that really have set this thing up for something really dynamic <coughs> to occur. Um, so are we saying that we would like to talk to the developer on Tuesday? I think we have to so that we don't just sit here and not let anything happen. I mean, yeah. it has yeah. to be, I think it's the ball's in his court and he has to make a decision. You know, it was incumbent on him to find financing and <coughs> he knew that the SSA was the backstop to make sure that this happened. And if that's the reason why he can't find financing, that's I, on I, him. Is this on? That's not on us. Uh, I just want to um, clarify that point. We required the SSA be put right. in place. And that is just to cover the bond payments in the early years. Um, that is money that the developer has to pay. And without the TIF in place, then that would just be a straight payment without any increment coming back to reimburse him. Right, but what the the payments that he was going to make up front on that were going to be paid back by the bonds. No, no, no. He's no. paying the bonds. We were going to pay him back the the uh, cost of the garage gap payments with increments. Right. right, and that's what I'm saying. The SSA was not meant to make bond payments. Actually, yes, it, it is. was. Yeah, the SSA is to make bond payments. Right, it, it was just additional increment beyond what's needed to pay the bond payments. Right, would pay the gap payments that were right, made. Right, because the, the SSA years. was there from day one. So that way, no matter if it if it if it needed twenty million dollars to pay the bonds off, and it could only make eighteen million, the two million was coming out of the SSA would huh. be assessed and and come up with the extra money to pay off the bonds. It could be, except that the developer was saying that he would rather make cash payments in those early years rather than have the SSA implemented. Right, because, and you I'm know, not worried about put the, the SSA I'm talking in about in total. Right. We'll so let him come in and make cash payments then to make up the difference. Fantastic. Right, but there has to be a, a, a means of increment to repay that right. no or the project won't move forward. Yeah. See, that's what I'm saying. This is the SSA, no matter what the difference is, in the, the total time frame of it, the SSA would have to be instituted to me day one mm -hmm. to be able to create enough money to pay that back. <coughs> There's no increment. Well, it actually. Yeah, yeah he's going to pay it in cash. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to implement that. I'm going to change my flight. I mean, I'm in well, I, I, see this. I, can't, <laughs> I can't see how you wouldn't implement the SSA because There's if you a wait a. M. until it's that. needed at the end, then the SSA goes call. from a little bit over a long period of time to a giant amount in a short period of time. But up front, if you wait until the increment then perhaps four years Towards the end, we predicted, based on how we extrapolated out the TIF rate increase at a modest 1%, I think, and then assessment at like 2% increase, the way that we calculated it towards like year 16 or 17, the bond would be paid off. And then that extra money we do, we pay him back the SSA contribution. And the gap payment. Or, the, or whatever that was he made by check. And then with ideally, thereafter, we'd actually have money to split out. I think it was one on one where we take a dollar, he takes a dollar for costs that weren't otherwise covered. So from the very beginning, we knew that he had to come up with some money early on because as soon as you issue those bonds, right. you got to start paying them. Pay mm -hmm. uh, and we're not going to increment until like four years after construction. Again, it's repeating myself, but it's all about the delay in breaking ground because every day you don't break ground is another day you don't collect an increment mm -hmm. four years later. And, you know, he didn't predict. I mean, really, we talked about this, that if this thing runs out, I, frankly, I'm not sure we'd be very welcome to sell bonds if we can't pay it back. I guess we have the commitment with the, the RDA, but if it just was a TIF-funded uh, bond repayment, uh, you know, we wouldn't have enough time, and I don't so, so who wouldn't tell us to even buy the, or sell the bonds. Couldn't he refinance a place in 17 years? It'd probably be a $100 million building. You think you can get $3 million loan out of it? 
I don't know, honestly. I think the big threat was <laughs> at the very end of the TIF <laughs> that he's got these lump payments uh, at the end, which falls on the ownership, whether it's him individually or the condo owners. I think that was the big concern. Was, I don't know. That's a good question. In the banking industry. That was, that was that's. <laughs> They're not going to find an answer for 20 years. <coughs> not the way commercial loans work. It's going to be a five or seven year arm once in a while. It'll do a 15 year term, but it's it doesn't work that way. Did you want to say anything else, Kevin? Or no. so we want the developer here. And we'll decide, or have him decide what he wants to do. Tuesday. 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 I wouldn't advise you put much else on the agenda. <laughs> 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 I think. Yeah, we do. Okay. That's project status, and maybe others. Is there, are there any others? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just one more. Just one no. more. I wanted to make a plug for the uh, Depot Museum is opening on Monday, and they have an exhibit that is um, about the history of the African American community here in Batavia, and it's supposed to be a, just a fabulous um, collection that they have on display. And they're doing something a little bit new on Thursday. They have an open house from five to seven p.m. next Thursday. And then on the 5th, 6th of March, they're going to have another flags and plano benefit down at Marmion Abbey uh, to help <coughs> raise funds to build the Flag Day Memorial. Mm -hmm. And tickets are now available and on sale. And, or I guess you can buy them through the Park District. Or you can either go to the um, flagdaymonument.com or org. Org. Dot org, and um, you can buy your tickets there, or on, there's an event right through the um, Facebook page. Elliot, just one quick one. Um, similar to Dan, I will be out uh, both Monday and Tuesday of next week, so um, I'm happy to dial in remotely if the committee is open to allowing that. Well, I was, counsel. are you on business? Because I'm on yes. business too. Shoot. <laughs> And we can only have one person dial in. I don't think we can. Well, he's yeah. gone. You're You're gonna three now, yeah. Oh, we have more now that we can do? I thought it was one and three. You guys yeah. just have to do your business together. Yeah. You're welcome. Will you be here on Monday? Join me in Philly. No, I will not. Not Monday either. Physically, I will not. I'm happy to dial in if yeah. the council is okay with that. Yeah. Same here. I would say if the first thing on the agenda. It'll be the first thing, but I don't know how long it'll last. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could be short. <laughs> Could be very short. It's first thing on the agenda. Just the <laughs> then we'll only be missing one. So you yeah, would be here. One. one would be on the phone. And in the meantime, we could do Skype. I'll talk to put you on a Howard and see if there's a way that Skype, we can have. We could, we could I, thought, you I, thought we could, I thought somebody said we could have more than one. You want to be phone. Skype Mark? There's two uh, lines. There's two lines. I don't, I, I'm not sure. There's two dialing lines. But if you okay. conference each other and then you call that line. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we just have to approve. Sure. Well, we don't have to approve that anymore, do we? No. They changed that. Have to object. We'd have to object. It's allowed unless we object to it. And you're on business, right? Not yes. vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vacation is the deal. Right. Right. Oh wait, what day was it? Why would I call in Tuesday. the stop? I was on vacation. <laughs> the third. <laughs> I'm not gone till the end of the month. I'm crazy that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we need a motion to go into executive session to set price of land for sale. So moved. Second. Motion by Knopf. Second by Meitzler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 